I would like to call, uh, I'm Dave Diaz, uh, board chair. I'd like to call the December 11th, 2014, uh, I almost said 12, uh, board meeting uh, in order. Uh, I'm going to ask Augie Beltran to lead the, uh, uh, as in the pledge of, uh, pledge of Allegiance, excuse me. John O'Rourke and uh, Bruce Russ, board members, are excused ab have excused absences, uh, and I'm going to ask Aaron to uh, call roll, please. Kevin Albany? Here. Audrey Galchan? Here. Linda Quitzer? Here. David Diaz? Here. Susan Grimsell? Okay, and before we uh, uh, introduce ourselves, I want to introduce uh, Susan Grizella. She's a brand new board member as uh, this today's her first meeting. So everybody, uh, Susan. Okay, now I'd like uh, to ask everybody to introduce themselves, and uh, I'm going to start this way with Ed Lang and go around. And oh, excuse me, and also uh, members of the public. It's uh, voluntary uh, for you to introduce yourselves. Excuse me. I'd like to remind everyone to, when they speak, to make sure they turn on their microphone button, and when you're done, turn it off. Ed Lang, public member. Nancy Springer, board member. Pastor Herrera, board member. Susan Grenzella, public member. Kevin Albanese, board member. Cindy Christensen, chief deputy registrar. David Vogt, mm -hmm. chief of enforcement. Karen Robinson, Chief of Licensing. Rick Lopes, Chief of Public Affairs. Aaron Eckerd, Registrar's Assistant. Kurt Hepler, Super Supervising Staff Counsel. Laura Zuniga, Chief of Legislation. Frank Shutter, Board Member. Linda Clifford, Board Member. Paul Shafino, Board Member. Bob Lamb, Board Member. Joan Hancock, Board Member. Augie Beltran, board member. Steve Sands, still registrar. <laughs> and I've introduced myself. I'm Dave Diaz, board member. Now it's time for the public uh, to introduce themselves if they wish. We'll start with Larry. Larry Parrott, uh, CSLB. <laughs> Angela Parrott, Larry's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Sands, Jan Sands, Sand, Steve's wife. <laughs> Much better. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> City Council Meadows, CSLB. Mike Franco, Attorney General's Office. Christina Delp, CSLB. Kevin Delp, Christina's husband. Betty C. Tun, Department of Consumer Affairs, Human Resources Manager. Nicole May, CSLB. Tamara Colson, Department of Consumer Affairs, Assistant General Counsel. Steve told me that if I just told you I'm the new Don Chang, you'd know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Gross That's everybody. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up with the extreme weather I guess we've had in here in uh, Northern California. And at least I know when I drove here, there was extreme weather. And I'd uh, like to thank everybody for that. Um, I'm going to ask other board members in a minute for their comments, but right now I wanted to say something uh, everybody knows, I'm assuming that's here. This is uh, Steve's last board uh, meeting, and we're going to present him with a couple things in a few minutes. But I would just like to say, I don't know if you guys can hear me when I turn my head, but um, it's been an absolute honor to work with you, Steve. I mean, I've been on other boards and, there, and committees and everything else, and you are so upstanding and insightful great movie critic um <laughs> he helps me out a lot that way um but no i mean it, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to work with you and i'm gonna i'm really sad to see you go but hey you know what everybody gets to retire and enjoy their life and i'm sure glad that you're going to be able to do that and uh have fun and i'm kind of jealous <laughs> so, any other board members uh, uh wish to uh address 
or make a comment, please. <laughs> you didn't think you'd get away without me making a comment, did you? I, I tried. Yeah, I know you did. I saw that. Uh, Steve, I'd also like to tell you that uh, I have nothing but the greatest respect for you and your and your outlook on how a board should be run. Uh, the years of experience you brought to this board has made this board what it is today, second to none in the state of California. Uh, and it's not just me saying that. A lot of people look to the CSLB because of your leadership to lead the way for the rest of the state. And uh, I'd want to personally congratulate you and call you a quitter. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I like to ditto those two remarks. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Master. well, uh, as uh, as a recent, I guess, new member to the board uh, and one from Seth, Southern California, there's a few of us. But I want to let you know, Steve, that we really, really appreciated your leadership. Um, really directing the board in areas that we needed some direction and guidance. And I think all of us feel that we really were part of a team here. And thanks to you and uh, your staff, uh, and particularly to you that really gave us the support and really gave us the guidance to really kind of uh, go through some difficult uh, decisions sometimes, policy decisions. And uh, we want to wish you the best. You deserve it. And there's life after you know working for the state. Uh, and uh, really enjoy your retirement, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future, too. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Steve Sands, I just want to congratulate you as well, and thank you so much for um, maintaining the equilibrium and the, the collaboration on this board. Um, all of us represent so many divergent interests, and um, you have really set uh, such an example to bring us all together. And I've heard you talk many times about how this board was when you first came to it and uh, certain rivalries that existed. And there's nothing but collaboration on this board. And it, it's a good feeling, and you're going out at a good time. So just wanted to thank you. and. Um, Thank you for being my foodie partner as well. <laughs> Mr. J. Dave. Oh. Oh, Nancy. Okay. Um, though I feel like I'm kind of a newbie, it's been just over a year. Um, you've made me feel very welcome from the get-go and the welcome in emails and um, very enjoyable. And I think you've um, really set the bar pretty high for this incoming person. <laughs> Thank you for everything you've done. Just as, as a member of industry, Steve, you've been a real champion for the contractors, been a real champion for the public, and haven't lost sight of that, and I think you've balanced that very well. As a newbie as well, uh, you've made me feel very welcome, you and your entire staff, and thank you very much. It's been a real honor to work with you the last year and a few months. Thank you. I am. Um, just on behalf of staff, I just want to say that Steve has been just one of the best leaders that the Department of Consumer Affairs has ever had. He's looked up to not only by the staff that work and report to him, but also his peers, other executive officers, individuals at agency, the legislature, and that's very hard to do. And uh, as Nancy said, it's a high bar, but um, I'm just very happy to have worked for you for this many years. So um, I wasn't on any other boards and hadn't participated in any political activities whatsoever until I joined this board. And so I joined with some trepidation about what it was all about and didn't know anything about anything. Not sure I know much more now. <laughs> but but, um, but Steve, took, I, I feel that you took me under your wing and you really kind of gave me a dose of, of uh, what it's all about. And I think that if the government could have a poster child for how it's supposed to work, you know, we hear plenty of gripes and complaints about uh, fiscal spending in state government and about how ineffectual or inefficient and too much spending, too much money. And the reality is it works really well with the right people in charge. And I think you've done an outstanding job of being the right person in charge. And thank you for that. I might point out he mentioned the term poster child. If you have not seen those posters in the back of the room, 
make sure you check those out when you get the chance. <laughs> I'll have some more comments at the end of the end of the meeting, but I, I have a pretty healthy perspective on this. I had a board member when I was on the architect's board. He said, Steve, you know, the cemetery is just full of irreplaceable people. And, <laughs> and you know, there's the real truth to that. I did notice uh, somebody in the back just came in. If they want to introduce themselves, it's an option. Jerry Parkinson. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to do a presentation to Steve Sands. Who's that? Oh, he's already forgot. Already forgotten. <laughs> so, um, who else is coming up with this? Just me? Just me. Yeah. Okay. Paul Sands. Smile, Steve. Yeah, Smile, yeah, there you go. Sands. Hmm, okay. SPS. I like that. Uh, whereas Stephen Paul Sands is retired from, uh, as register of the California Contractor State License Board after more than 13 years of dedicated service Holy <laughs> uh, in the position that, uh, uh, and a stellar 36 year career with the Cali De California Department of Consumer of Affairs. In recognition thereof, he is deserving of the highest commendations and honors. Whereas uh, employed by the Department of Consumer Affairs since 1978. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in high school. I'd just like to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Yeah, I was in fourth grade. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Steve Sands has demonstrated remarkable Skill, really? Oh, okay. Uh, dedicated to excellence and professional uh, uh, competence in the uh, department's legislative office, management analysis, legal services until 1984, where he is appointed assistant executive officers, officer to the California Architects Board. And whereas a tribute to his outstanding service as an executive officer of the Architects Board from 1986 through 2000, <coughs> Steve was conferred honorary membership in American Institute of Architects and received a president, president citation, presidential citation award, uh, I'm getting out of glare so it's hard to read, uh, from the American Institute of Architects, California Council, the pres uh, presidential award for service to the American public from the National Council of Architectur Architectural Registration Boards and whereas having served as a register for the California Con Contractor State License Board since 2001, Steve, January 2001, so you're basically doing 14 years, right? Yeah. Uh, assumed leadership in the board at the time of great challenge and helped grow the regulatory program into an influential organization recognized for his leadership, effective, effectiveness, and, and commitment to consumer protection, not only in California and to the, and to the United States, but throughout the world. And whereas a leader in the Department of Consumer Affairs, Steve has uh, fostered his employees' unwavering dedication to protecting the public, served as, as a mentor to other executive officers, provided innovative policy in support of the department and its other boards, mm -hmm. and he has further shared his ex expertise as the director of the National Association of State Architects or sorry, state contract licensing agency since 2002. Uh, and whereas Steve graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1971, um, served <laughs> this country honorably until 1978, completing his military service as captain at Mather Air Force Base. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Uh, wow. Uh, as whereas well a devoted family man, Steve has found a seamlessly perfect balance between professional success with the Department of Consumer Affairs, service to the, uh, uh, to the state, contract, state contractor license, licensing industry, and commitment to his wife, Jan Mixel Sands. Is that how you say it? Mixel. Mixel, okay, sorry. 
and their children, Sarah Born Sands and Emily Claire Sands. And whereas, during his career with the Department of Consumer Affairs, Steve Sands has been much more than a colleague. He has been the source of inspiration and guidance, a calming force during the periods of extraordinary time and pressure, and a solid foundation during the periods of change. And most importantly, he has been a good friend whose uh, presence will be profoundly missed now and therefore after. And this uh, resolved by the pre uh, President Pro Tempore of California State Senate Daryl Steinberg and Assembly Member Roger Dickinson. Thank you. There you go. You tell her not the, the optometry board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the lights were shining. I couldn't see it half the time. <laughs> I think, actually, it was double glare. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll make some comments later, but I do, I'm particularly proud for the fact that Senator Steinberg and Assembly Member Rich, uh, Roger Dickinson uh, authored that resolution. I've known Roger Dickinson since 1978. I worked on his very first campaign when he ran for Sacramento City Council. He's a very honest, decent, honorable man, and the citizens of the state of California will miss his service in the, in the legislature. But I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to have Senator Steinberg as one of the best leaders the, senator, the Senate ever had, and, and Roger. So I'm particularly proud of that fact. So thank you. Yeah, one more. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> And this one, the Contractor State License Board, the Legacy of Leadership. Stephen P. Sands, Register of Contractors, uh, 2001 to 2014. With great appreciation, thanks for the for instituting remarkable professional standards and improvements to establish CSLB as a national leader in consumer protection and your service and dedication to the people of California for 36 years. Presented today, December 11, 2014. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. The, uh, Let's get back to work. Okay. <laughs> what do we got now? Uh, we got 10 minutes, so let me finish off. Okay, it's public comment time. See. Okay. For items on the agenda as well as, uh, as well as items not on the agenda, the board cannot take an action on any items not listed on the agenda. Public may comment during this time or when agenda items come up. We will ask the public for comment prior to taking action on any item. If we forget to ask for public comment, they can raise their hand and they will be recognized. We may limit public comment to five minutes per individual. Are there anybody that wants to address the board at this time? Okay. Uh, do you want to try? Do you think we have time for? All right. Uh, review, review and approval of the September 23rd, 2014 board meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Anything on the question? Any? Nope. Okay. No changes. All in favor? Aye. Okay, the board is going to go into closed session to con conduct interviews, discuss and consider the appointment of the new registrar. This may take up to three hours. Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, close um, session pursuant to the subdivision A1 of the section 11126 of the government code uh, register interviews. So uh, the board is now going to close and we'll be back. Uh, 
Uh, how, how do we do it? Okay. Correct. That's all he has to say before we go to closed session? Uh, correct. Uh, Mr. President, members, right now, uh, pursuant to the agenda, we're now going to move. The board will now move into closed session. Pursuant to that government code section to deliberate, hold interviews, and consider the appointment of a subsequent registrar. And so. how do we uh, notify everybody that we're coming back? Well, they can, uh, for those of you, if you, you can either do the most, uh, I guess, uh, you know, easy thing is hang around until we get done, <laughs> or uh, perhaps if you could leave a phone number with Ms. Eckert or a text number or something, we can uh, text you when it's can text when it's completed. I'll send a text to everyone's number that I have. And it'll probably be more like two hours, I think, than, than yeah. three hours. But um, so if you plan on being back here an hour and a half or so, to, just to be safe, if you don't get a text, that might be a, a good idea. So everyone has to go except for. Okay, the people remaining in closed session will be myself, Ms. Colson, Council. You will have two representatives. Uh, two seven, uh, two December 11th, uh, 2014, board me meeting back into session. All righty, everybody coming? Okay. During uh, the closed session, uh, the board uh, has a recommendation that uh, for the next register, it's going to go to the director of the DCA for his approval and go from there. Uh, and that's all we got to say about that for now. And now we're going to move on to uh, the enforcement committee. Uh, Bob Lamb, please. Thank you, Chair Diaz. Uh, my name is Bob Lamb, enforcement committee chair. Uh, Turn to agenda item F1, Enforcement Program Update. November 5th and 6th, enforcement conducted the NFL California Blitz undercover sting operations in seven cities around the state. A total of 112 people were arrested during the two-day operation in Alhambra, Aptos, Castro Valley, Chula Vista, Montecito, uh, Rancho Mirage, and West Sacramento. At this time, I would like to thank Board Chair David Diaz for attending the Al Alameda sting. He brought pizzas and sprung for a combo. <laughs> two. two combos. Wait, we have to give credit where credit is due. Board Chair Diaz, two attaboys. I also want to commend enforcement's commitment to staff development. 46 enforcement staff completed a five-day CSLB Development Enforcement Academy, and I applaud the plan to continue the academy and de develop advanced training courses for graduates. Total attendance at CSLB sponsored training was 212 for the calendar year. And for those of you who are new to the board, uh, that's something that I've taken as a, a personal project. And it's something that I think that uh, to this day has been paying dividends. And uh, I want to thank everyone on the board for their continued support of that. I think it's, it's really a uh, feather in the CSLB's cap. And I think it'll pay just dividends for long, long term by having trained staff that's engaged. And I really appreciate it. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Director Fote. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. If we could turn to uh, page one, just to, I want to provide us a quick update on where the enforcement staff are focusing their attention. And the first, uh, what you'll see is uh, a highlight relating to plumbing scams. Uh, we're taking a hard look at some of the consumer complaints that we're receiving. I provided two highlights. One relates to a 65-year-old homeowner that hired a contractor to uh, unclog a drain, and uh, the initial contract price perform repair work was $4,700. But as we're finding in a lot of these complaints, it soon increased over $10,000. And it, what you're finding is that we have plumbing contractors now targeting the elderly. We we have a problem as we previously reported in the heating and air conditioning industry. But now we got to take a look at the plumbing industry. And another highlight relates to a 78-year-old homeowner. Uh, a similar situation, she had a coupon, called somebody out, and what you find is that they say they tell them that the main line has to be replaced or significant repairs are needed and those repairs are generally done and there's no evidence later as to whether that was true or not 
But in this situation, $13,800 was paid. Her son complained. And of course, we're inter intervening and we're able to get some restitution for the consumers. But how many consumers don't file a complaint? And that's what's troubling. And if you go to home, uh, homefinders.com, you can see what the average price to replace a, a sewer line is. And it's far less than $13,000. Generally, it's about $6,000. On the bottom of page one, we provided a well driller highlight. Uh, our, our executive uh, office, our staff here with Steve Sands and uh, Cindy Christensen have been active with the, what we call the, uh, the drought uh, task force, Cindy especially, and working with the governor's office on putting together a plan to address the drought and predatory contractors that come in and take care of vulnerable consumers that do not have an active well. And what you have in this situation is it was a dry, it's a dry uh, drill, and they, they, they dug or they drilled and they found no water and a $100,000 refund was obtained. So that was a real positive. On the following page, just a couple of real quick highlights relating to uh, some of our consumer complaints. On page two, we have Mitch Tupo, who's an unlicensed contractor, and he's someone that you see that's just a repeat offender. Uh, we just recently made a, re a referral to the Riverside DA. We've had great success, as you know, in Riverside County, getting these repeat offenders prosecuted, many of them receiving state prison sentences. And we're believing that that's going to be the same for him. On page four, just want to provide a quick update on David Tellis. Uh, $2,100 down payment paid on a $5,000 contract. The bond paid out. Uh, in some situations, we might close a case when the bond pays out. But in this situation, when somebody did receive a deposit, perform no work, a citation, administrative citation was appropriate. And what we found interesting is he left for London and he was subsequently convicted of sexual activity with a child. And he will be deported after serving six years of his prison sentence in London. On page seven, we have an update regarding our uh, solar system. And What's interesting is that we have what's known as the HERO program. It's a home energy renovation opportunity. And most contractors that are, in, are participating in the HERO program are law-abiding. However, there are some that are unscrupulous. And the way this works is you have, you have funding, generally at the county level, where the money is paid back through your property tax bill. And there's a lot of scams that are happening within the HERO program. I recently received a call from a, a salesperson that was representing a, a statewide solar company. And she called me to tell me that she had sold over 100 projects, 100 contracts. And now these customers were calling her because the work wasn't being performed. So we're looking into that. We have other consumers that have come to us not understanding what a kilowatt hour of electricity costs. Only, only to find they've signed an agreement, generally a 20-year agreement, to have energy provided to them for a kilowatt hour price that's greater than what they could get from their public utility. So in this situation, we have, a, we have an elderly uh, consumer that didn't realize that he would be subsequently paying, I guess it was like over $2,000 a year, towards his $23,000 uh, installation, I guess $2,600 per year on his tax bill. When we were able to get involved in this, the HERO program uh, did address the complaint, and they've, they've waived that, uh, that cost for him, which is a good thing. But we're working closely with our public affairs office to develop outreach and, and also to work with the HERO program. Steve Sands and Cindy Christensen and I and others have met with representatives that are participating in the HERO program to develop that plan. On page 8. We have our statistics. We're continuing to achieve the board objective of maintaining uh, a closure goal for our field investigators of 10 per enforcement representative. Uh, perhaps most importantly, we're resolving the majority of the licensee complaints within 60 days of receipt. And we're exceeding the board goal of 30% by settling 40, over 40% 40 with restitution paid to a consumer. On page 9, we have a bar chart, and we've included this to show that out of the 3,000 complaints that are open at any one time, we're continuing to achieve the board goal of having less than 100 of them that exceed 270 days in age. On page 11, we provided statistics relating to our, our undercover operations and our proactive enforcement that's conducted by our SWIFT team. And what you'll see is a chart at the bottom 
930, of, of 930 unlicensed or, or, and or contractors that have employees without workers' comp received a notice to appear in criminal court. We're very pleased and proud of that statistic. Uh, one concern that we have is with our partnering with other state agencies on, on, uh, on sweep operations. Uh, we've recently, we had a situation down in San Diego where we went to a site where there were a number of uh, individuals working and one of those individuals invited our employee into the house, which just happened to show the work that was being done. It turned out that that contractor was unlicensed. That homeowner was concerned that the contractor that he had hired did invite one of our investigators into the home. Uh, subsequently, he was okay with it when he realized we were there to protect him and that that person was unlicensed and operating illegally. But, it, it, but the result was our partners, the Department of Industrial Relations, took a look at how our Labor Enforcement Task Force is operating. And so right now, we, we've engaged in a pilot program where instead of prioritizing the residential uh, inspections, we're looking at the commercial. And the, 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 sh the short-term results are not good. That what we're finding is that in the commercial arena, most of the contractors are licensed and they have workers' comp. It's in the residential where you have the violations occurring. Uh, we, we plan to address this further at the Enforcement Committee meeting, come back to the board with what the findings are. On page 14, we have an industry bulletin for uh, George Stanley. Many of you know George Stanley. Six-year investigation resulted in an 11-year prison sentence. Took a long time because when you're dealing with transient criminals, they generally will they will pay restitution to stay out of state prison. So it, it takes just a, a concerted effort to achieve what, what needed to be done there, and that was the state prison sentence. On page 14, we have an update regarding electrician certification. Uh, just to give you a little background on electrician certification as to how we've enforced it and why, and why we've looked at it further. When the, when the board was uh, authorized to investigate and take action against licensed C-10 contractors for electrician certification requirements, uh, I personally went out and met with groups throughout the state and asked them how we should enforce this law. How could it be done in a simple way where everybody would understand and we could support our actions? And the, the, the consensus was that if someone's controlling the electrical circuit, if they've got the wire, they're in charge of that electrical circuit, that they own that project and they should be either certified or in the apprenticeship or trainee program. And so in 2010, uh -huh. that's how we began to enforce the law. And we've had tremendous success. Out of 50 legal actions that we've taken against contractors with uncertified electricians, we've only lost one case. And that was because the witness was, did not testify competently at the hearing that he actually saw anything being done. So it's been a very effective strategy. Now, what's happened subsequent to our authorization to enforce that law is what's known as the uh, roadway decision. And the roadway decision took a look at the wages that are being paid to electricians and found that it expanded the way, it, it, they didn't address the way the, the board is enforcing electrician certification, but what it did address is when you're considered an, elect, an electrician for the purposes of paying prevailing wage. And so it expanded the holding of the wire to the installation of the conduit and the raceways and other electrical work. And so what we did is we asked the uh, Attorney General's office to review roadway and to tell us if roadway had any impact on how we were enforcing the law. Is this something that we should consider when we're alleging that somebody needs to be certified and they're not? And this is important for us because we're relying on the International Brother Electrical Workers and the Western Electrical Contractor Association's compliance investigators to go out and do these inspections or do these, in they're out there in the field and they're determining if these workers are certified or not. And they need to know what the rules are. And when they rely on roadway, uh, perhaps erroneously thinking that that impacts our ability to enforce the law, and if that's not true, it undermines our ability to support our actions. So we asked the AG to render an opinion. They didn't render an opinion, but they did write a letter, and you all have a copy of it. And that letter, uh, just to summarize, it says that Roadway in no way has any impact on the contractor's board's uh, enforcement of electrical certification as it pertains to issuing a disciplinary action on a, on, a, on a license. So I'd like to just stop there and see if there are any questions.
Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a few, Dave. Uh, my, my past discussions, it was either, the enforcement was either somebody that was basically installing conductors or terminating the device. It was our definition. Is that, am I correct about that or not? Our, for our enforcement purposes, what we are, what we are asking the you know, compliance investigators to provide to us in a report is evidence that somebody, if they were connecting the device, meaning that they were connecting a wire, then they would be required to be certified. But it comes down to the evidence that we have. Our investigators, unless they are out on a sweep, are not enforcing this law. This is being enforced by uh, IBW and WICA. I and, understand that. And so it's really, the, what we're expecting from them is that they show, and this is what they told us was easiest to find. Somebody is holding the wire, connecting the wire, pulling the wire. Okay. But what, I kind of I kind of worry what our, is this a wire? I don't know. Is this, this Romex, is that a wire? I mean, I, I and, the, the pro my problem with this thing is I think our interpretation is way too narrow. All of these things, I've, I've handed out some on here, all of these components, including some conduit here, all of these components, basically the conduit becomes a ground system. It is a conductor when it's installed as, as a conduit system. These wires basically are, are, these are conductors and these are installed when they, in, 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 in houses all over. Anybody who's doing any part of this work is part of putting an electrical system in and these are electrical devices, all of them. And uh, I, 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 I have this, 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 this problem with the narrow interpretation. The law basically was designed to maintain minimum <laughs> standards for the competency and the training of electricians through a system of testing and certification. That's the number one thing it says in this law. That's, that's the first thing it says. And I don't see how by narrowing it down how we're, we're basically doing that. If we allow people to stall portions of the system and say that they're not covered, they go without training. We don't know what they've done. There's going to be a, a resurgence in housing pretty quick. And these systems are reliant on being installed. The, the warranty and the durability of the systems are reliant on how they're installed. And if we're not enforcing this thing at least a little broader than we are right now, I don't see how we're really serving the public and, and, and our consumers in guaranteeing that they're getting quality work. Well, I'm just wondering what the next step would be. Would that be something that we could address at the enforcement committee meeting? <coughs> we could. I think so. Sure. Yeah. We can put it back on the agenda. I mean, that's, that's something we can look at. All right. I would like to make one comment. Um, we are not experts. That's not our role to make those determinations. Um, what David has said when he worked out with the electricians and laborers and everyone else is what can the board do realistically to enforce when licensed C-10 contractors utilize um, electricians who aren't certified. We don't know when they should be certified or not. That's not our role. We don't have that expertise. Um, so even, in my opinion, even if we made it broader, changed how we enforced it, the priorities of the board would dictate that we probably wouldn't take cases beyond holding the wire anyway. Now that's something the board has determined. I'm just throwing that out. You can go ahead and have it go back to the enforcement committee, but the practical reality is, in my opinion, the board will probably never go beyond or should go beyond how it enforces this particular part of the law given the priorities that the board has set, resources, and the agreement that we reached that quite frankly has been working. The other thing to keep in mind, this is for future reference if you go, go down this road, the other reason that we asked the AG is our, the AG quite frankly, I'll put words, these are my interpretations, I'm not a lawyer, the AG is confused about this part of the law, and I don't think, they think we have much of a leg to stand on to go beyond this, i.e. if we did, took a case, we'd probably lose it, and the whole baby might get thrown out with the bathwater. I won't go up beyond that, I won't clarify it anymore, but I'm just warning the board, if you, my opinion, if you 
keep messing with this, it's going to create a lot bigger problem than you think you might have now. And I'm sorry I can't be more clear. It may sound circumspect, but, you know, I opposed this law when it was introduced. Uh, um, I knew it was going to cause us problems. And I would encourage the board, no matter what the issue is in the future, try not to get involved in these scope of practice issues that pit um, different workers against other ones, because that's not our role. We license contractors to protect consumers. So I just want to, before you continue, I just want to give my own personal perspective on this issue for your consideration. Thank you. I, 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 I take a little exception with that, Steve. S specifically, I know there's, there's, there's budget problems with in this enforcement. I know this is a r rough deal. I know you didn't. I know the contractors board didn't want to be given that. But we, we own it right now. The, the, my problem with it is that if we, if we don't enforce this with a little bit broader picture, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make this a union or non-union issue. It is a quality of standards issue. Inspectors cannot catch all of the things that are going on. A, a, a person who has had some training, and that's what the whole law basically is, is, is focused on, is training and making those people qualified to do the work. And I think we have a consumer responsibility to try to do our best to see that that gets done. That's my point. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, yeah, I, I would just, uh, with all due respect, Frank, and, and with deference, not deference, but, uh, you know, the, this whole electrician certification has caused a lot of angst in the industry, and we're here to protect the public. Um, you know, the, I appreciate and agree that we want to have trained people out there doing the work, but that's really up to the contractor's purview. I know that there's A contractors out there that can connect these same wires and have no certification because they're A contractors versus C10. I'm not sure how us in putting ourselves in the middle of the dispute between the work assignments. I mean, that's really not what I understand the license board to be here for. We're here to enforce the law, and that's our job, and to protect consumers. But we're not really here. I don't know that this board wants to get itself in the middle of the work assignments, of especially the traditional work assignments that have been out there. And I think we need to be very cautious about going down that road. And even under the, the guise of, of safety, which I wholeheartedly agree with, when you could have one contractor that's an A contractor and one contractor that's a C10 have two totally different requirements just by virtue of their license, I, I think it's a real challenge. And, and I would just encourage the enforcement committee and the, uh, our, our enforcement policies that we stay true to what the CSLB is here for. If I could just make one statement on behalf of the Attorney General's office, unfortunately they had to leave. But one of the concerns that they've had is the simple reading of the law says engaging in the connection of electrical devices. And, you know, one thing they brought up is perhaps there's an opportunity at some point for the electrical industry to, conf uh, to let us know or to be more specific what that means. That would really solve the problem. And whatever we come up with, whatever we decide, we're going to have to put on training for the compliance investigators and to a certain extent for the Attorney General's Office to prosecute these cases. <clears throat> My last point about this is, and I, and, and I realize there's a big difference between A and C, but the vast majority of electrical work is done by the C, C10 contractors. And the other thing is, simple definitions you can look up in the, in, in the uh, basically online, basically make any current carrying device, any, any current carrying system is an electrical device. And so we, we're, this, is, this is the part of, of, of the definition that I don't understand, that we don't understand. I mean, you can look up an, any electrical uh, 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 reference, reference material and they'll tell you exactly what electrical device is. And it's not either a receptacle or it's not making connecting the wires, it's the system. Under this current standard, we could have people totally untrained putting 1,000 amp switchboards in place, certifying that they were bolted down properly, earthquake. We could have them basically checking the bus connections on the things and putting the breakers in as long as they didn't hook a wire to them. And to me, this just is it's, it's just nonsensical. If we're going to have a law that we're going to enforce, we should enforce it, or at least have rules that we say that we're going to enforce it. I realize there's budget problems in enforcement. I do realize that there's a lot of things to do and there's a lot of unethical contractors out there. And I really have to say, and, I'm, and I don't mean to sound, this is kind of like my thing because I'm an electrical contractor. 
but this board does a great job. I know enforcement works very hard. Steve has done a great job. I, re I, I, I don't mean to, to, to sound like I'm critical of what we're doing. It's just this, this one little thing I would like to see basically have a little bit broader t interpretation. I mean, I think this board works wonderfully. I'm very proud to be part of it. But this little thing is my bug, OK? Thanks. Do we have any uh, a pu a public comment? Anywhere? No? OK. Um, you have a loyally like comment, Mr. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, in all candor, uh, Mr. Vote, are you looking for some sort of action? I, I, don't, I don't quite understand kind of where we are in the world. I see the, I read the AGs. I won't call it an opinion. I'll call it a letter because I think that that's what they call it. So it seems logical to me that the board does have some questions about the gravamen of this letter as compared to the question. So I'm just curious, would this be either better better tackled at a subsequent board meeting when the AG is here to perhaps explain the issue? Or is it kind of the board's inkling that it sent the matter be essentially remanded or returned to the enforcement committee for, um, you know, perhaps a little seasoning and, and, and revisitation? So I'm just, I'm, I'm not, is there any action contemplated here? The intent was not for any action to be contemplated. It was it was to distribute the letter that we had received so that it was out. Uh, just, to, just to close out the update. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just to uh, to close the update, we provided the training that's been. Uh, we provided the training in 2013 through 2014. We've also provided some ideas for you for training in 2015. We're real ex excited about uh, the advanced training courses that uh, Doug Galbraith, a retired annuitant, and Mike Franklin are putting together. And just to give you kind of an idea, we're, we're looking at, we're filing more cases with the DAs, and we need to have more training and, and testifying and criminal proceedings. Also looking at uh, we may want to look at public works more and how we can become uh, more uh, conscious or uh, uh, more easier to identify or more effective in handling those type of complaints. And always report writing is, is a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, focus for us in making sure that our cases are written properly. And so that would conclude the update, unless there are any questions. Uh, David, just one quick question on, on page uh, 8 of your uh, statistics handling. Um, you, the max, uh, uh, well, the concern I had, you had the max of uh, the number of uh, management level of pending complaints is 3185, right? And we're at 3084, which is about 100 uh, complaints before we reach our maximum low workload that you can handle with pending staff. And I did see in the executive report that there are 19 vacancies currently in your division. I don't know how many of those vacancies are, are um, uh, uh, people that do, were cases, but if you bring on those, those folks uh, or you fill those vacancies, the management level of pending complaints would increase, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's because we have those vacancies that we're at the, the almost $100 maximum that we can handle. Right, and if we were to exceed that, then we would come back to the board and perhaps uh, ask for a process changes, or we have a, uh, an example of staff that could be redirected is, is our waiver. Uh, application task force where we're looking at these RMOs that aren't actively involved. You may have to redirect that staff. Okay. We've also got staff working proact in proactive enforcement that could be redirected. But we keep a very close eye on the caseload because we want to handle our cases timely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. And that concludes the Enforcement Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Yeah, permit sign, yeah. Oh, 
Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, go to agenda item F2, review and discussion regarding permanent enforcement. Dave. Thank you. We have great news regarding our permit enforcement. We put together a permit complaint form where building departments or uh, contractors, the general public, can file permit uh, for when they suspect somebody's done work without a permit, it doesn't have to be on their home. And we provide statistics as to our success in investigating those complaints. It's in your packet. Now, the problem, though, has been that we're experiencing some difficulties in some jurisdictions, and that's why we wanted to talk about that this afternoon. Uh, many building departments are receptive and cooperative in working with us, but not all are. And if we have a complaint that comes to us by a, a member of industry, the work's being done regularly by a contractor uh, that requires a permit and no permit has been obtained, we need to address that, that violation. And to address that violation, we need the cooperation of the building department. That means they need to be willing to tell us whether a permit was obtained at that address, that they have an ordinance that adopts the requirement, and that no permit was obtained. It's not a lot of work, but it is, it is a necessary requirement for us to support an action. And the other problem that we've experienced is that if we subpoena a building inspector to come down and testify to those requirements, they want to check for $250 upon receipt of the subpoena, and we're not able to pay for something in advance of the services being provided. So that results in a case that might have to be withdrawn. So we need to take a look at that. And the third thing I just want to put on the table is some of these building departments have been very cooperative with us. They've set up protocols where we can go into their building department and they'll tell us about suspect owner builder sites. And that is where somebody's come in, homeowners come in, and they've signed off on it. They signed an application for permit. They're stating they have no employees, they have no contractor working for them, and yet they're going to perform an extensive remodel. They're going to put a roof on, they're going to do something that clearly they can't do themselves. So by identifying those suspect job sites, we can go out and inspect them, and generally we're going to go out with their code enforcement officers. And so in some in various cities and counties, and Nancy Springer's really been a leader with this, we're having a tremendous, we're having tremendous success, but in other jurisdictions we're not. And so when we're struggling, we took a look at our Calbo Memorandum of Understanding that we adopted back in 2006, and it was interesting talking to Nancy because what she told me is that many jurisdictions are not aware of this. And so I'd like for Nancy to take it over now. You've got some great ideas that we could perhaps share at the Enforcement Committee meeting. Hey, Nancy Springer. So um, in talking with Dave, um, the one concern with the $250 witness fee that's regulated by a government code, um, I think in some cases the code might even say $275. Um, I did speak with um, my county council, and then I also um, spoke with Kurt, and Kurt thinks there's a section that might be able to waiver that, and my county council is um, concurring with that. He's saying that there could be agreements worked out where if it's the benefit to that jurisdiction. If we're bringing forth this complaint, it only seems that we should be working with the state and not charging them for that, um, that witness there. So um, that's something I think we can work on and we can um, check out on the government code. In regards to the Calbo MOU that was drafted back in um, 2005 or six, that board, the board, Calbo is California Building Officials. It is a chapter of International Code Council who publish our codes. And so what that means is there's several chapters throughout the state. We're not like the state fire marshal where you have a state fire marshal and then everybody in the state is connected to that one entity. We're, um, we're all different jurisdictions. We're counties and we're cities. So not everybody is a member of CALBO. People look to CALBO as a, as a state group and look to them for direction because they are very successful and they've been around for over 50 years and the majority do join that. However, what I was stating to Dave is that counties, they're very minimum um, staff. You know, some only have one building official, and that's the inspector, the code enforcement officer, the whole the whole valley rock there. Um, and then there's others, and they don't have the funding to be able to go to Calbo annual business means or to do the even pay for the membership. So they're not even aware of what happens. So we do have county building officials where that's the one they choose. If I'm going to have money, I'm going to join that group. So my suggestion was that. Um, and then let me go back one step. Cabo also has a board of directors, and that changes almost every, every year, if not every three years. They rotate directors in and out. So the people who wrote this, this um, MOU, I, I would almost say probably not even one of them are still on the board or, or the board of directors. So my suggestion today was that we reconnect 
um, and I can assist, and that is to reconnect and reestablish our relationship, CSB's re relationship with CALBO, and consider the MOU, but also to, to reach out to county building official group as well, and then maybe pick 10 different building departments, have MOUs with them, and then show how that's working, and then eventually work through the different chapters. Because throughout the state, we have several chapters. There's, there's many. There's LA Basin, there's Napa, Solano, Shasta Cascade, Yosemite. So they're all spread out, and they're all the same as Kelbo, except for Kelbo's the bigger one. So we would reestablish that connection, work out a new MOU, and then maybe establish a group of 10 building departments. And I would say that maybe that's something that the committee, enforcement committee, can consider on how to make that happen. Thank you, Board Member Springer. That was an excellent report. We really appreciate your help. Well, well worthwhile. Thank you so much. Uh, if there's no, any further questions, that will conclude the Enforcement Committee report. Question, Chair, just a quick one. Um, if you could just sum it up in a few words, David, wh why are building officials not supporting our, es our efforts to assist? And, a a yeah. lot of it is because of the city attorney. They have city attorneys that are looking at this government code and saying that uh, they want the money up front. That's one problem. Other building officials are, are just not aware of the benefit that they receive when they work with us. Uh, they don't understand how we can help them to achieve their laws. I think they're just simply uh, wanting to go out and inspect when possible. And I, I had an opportunity to address more than 100 building officials in L.A., and it was really it was fascinating about the HVAC issue. In, in some situations, they think that the codes don't make sense as it relates to energy efficiency, so they're reluctant to participate. But Nancy, you might be able to share more information on that. Yeah, you, and you also have a, a new group of building officials that uh, – we're having that the disappearing building official. We have a huge gap right now. Many of these people have retired. Um, you got a lot of new people that are in there that don't even know that. They probably they know contractor state license board just is a place for contractors to go to get licensed and not realize that all these other benefits that they have that we can work with them. They don't realize that they could connect up and help each other in that sense. They're probably not even aware of that. Um, like some of the programs you offer, like Senior Scammer, even I myself, before getting involved in reaching the higher status in within the building department, I wasn't even aware of that stuff. So I think it's educating them as well. And that's something when you reach out to the different building departments and start reaching out to these chapters, I think we can educate them in that way. I don't know that it's not that they don't want to help. I think they are by the um, the government code, which we'll work through. But I think it's more of educating them to know that we're a good resource for them. Is that a job for enforcement or a job for Rick Lopes? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, I was going to add something to that right along those lines. When we've been willing to go to uh, in front of a city council or a board of supervisors and talk about the benefit to working together to support that building official, it works a lot better. And I think that's got to be a component here. And having industry support also works. So are we done with the enforcement committee yeah. report? Okay. On to public affairs. Pastor Herrera. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll be uh, sh uh, kind of short here, and so Rick can really uh, carry the ball here. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Uh, one with the uh, senior scam stoppers. Uh, this year, we... Uh, uh, completed 86 senior scam stoppers uh, throughout the state of California. Uh, 86, that's a lot of, uh, of sessions that uh, uh, Jane uh, quite coordinated. Uh, in fact, in, in one week, she was in six different cities uh, doing one of these uh, uh, seminars. And, uh, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year. And uh, so many times they, they had, she had to double up uh, a couple of these uh, uh, seminars in one place. I was at the one, uh, the last one of the year uh, on Tuesday in Simi Valley, and there was a really, really good group of, of seniors there that participated. Uh, the senior center was very, very active, and they really welcomed us. Uh, the representatives from the legislative office 
uh, Pauli, uh, uh, Senator Pauli, she was, uh, she didn't attend, but her staff was there and talk about building relationships with these offices. It's a really, really wonderful way to, to build those relationships. Um, on another item I just wanted to highlight is um, if you like uh, analytical data or numbers, there's a lot of uh, uh, numbers on our website uh, uh, attached to this report, a uh, whole, whole slew of numbers and charts that you might want to look at and also on our successes in the media, well, social media realm. Uh, the Public Affairs Office has also been uh, uh, pretty busy with two press events that they conducted from the last time that we met in September. Uh, they did one press conference in Napa uh, dealing with the earthquake uh, damages that were there and uh, kind of alerting the public as to be careful with uh, hiring uh, unlicensed contractors. And they did another <clears throat> uh, press conference in Chula Vista down in Southern California for a big uh, sting operation that they had in November. Uh, and one last thing is Rick and uh, uh, investigator U U Ubaldo Sanchez uh, made an appearance on a reality show called Catch a Contractor. And uh, Rick will tell you more about that. Take it away, Rick. Thanks, Pastor. Actually, you gave a lot of, of good details there, but I will touch on a few things. First, on page one of the update in the, uh, the website redesign, as you can see on September 5th, we did uh, successfully launched the new website, which was something that was a long time coming, a lot of work behind the scenes with uh, not only public affairs, but our information technology. And our hats off to them. We, they don't get seen a lot, but we do have a, a really great IT team behind the scenes with the website. And, and I would stand our website up to anybody else in state government as far as uh, the use of technology and being on the leading edge uh, of how we utilize that. What I wanted to point out is going into this when we launched the site, we, we, we thought some things were going to happen and some of the statistics are starting to play themselves out well and it's interesting so I wanted to point them out to the board so if you can see the chart there on page one. I'll try to explain this as best I can. If you have other questions I'll, I'll defer to, um, to Raj and, and, and some other folks from you know, the IT uh, that can maybe answer those. But uh, here's a couple of statistics comparing our old website to our new website. The page visited per session, so this is whenever somebody comes to our website, how many different pages do they look at on the website during their visit? The average from earlier this year, from January up through September, was just under five pages. So if anybody came to our site, they saw five different pages. With the new website, that number has increased up to just over eight. So people are looking at more when they're on our site. The next one is the average session duration. When they come to our website, how long do they stay with us? As you can see, the old website, they averaged uh, just under five minutes, and that's now gone up to six and a half minutes. So they're looking at more pages. They're spending more time on our site. And then the bottom one is what's called a bounce rate. And you can see I've got the uh, definition right below the chart there. This is basically the number, the percentage of people who come to our website and only look at one page. Um, so you can see almost a third of the people that came to our old, old website only went to one page. That number has dropped down to just under 18%. And so we talked about that and tried to, you know, think you know, why why would these things happen? And we, uh, as we note there, are saying that we we think it's because the the pages are better organized, the navigation is better, and the site is certainly it, it's streamlined with its look and feel. And we and we think that that's part of the reason why we've gotten a lot of good feedback. We have the possibility for people to provide us with feedback, um, and so far the the reaction has been very positive. I also did want to draw your attention, as Pastor mentioned, is at the end, right after page 11 in your report, is we did pull some statistics. And I don't want to kind of bog the meeting down in a, in a bunch of statistics, but I did want to draw just a few things to your attention. So I'm sorry the pages aren't numbered, but the first page directly after page 11, there, the overview. In the bottom left, I just wanted to note, this is the percentage of people, this is since the launch of the new website. The, as you can see, 80%, just over 80% of the people who visit our website are on desktops or on PC you know, computers. 15% of them are on mobile phones, and about 4.5% are on tablets. If you look at the next page, it compares the number of returning visitors to the number of new visitors. You can see 77% uh, of the people visiting our site are new, 
or sorry, returning visitors. And if you look at the charts on both of those pages at the top where you see the little lines that go up and down, the vast majority of people that visit our website happens Monday through Friday. So you can see the high points on all of those curves are all on the weekdays, and you can see we drop down dramatically on the weekends. And we think that's it's because a lot of people are, you know, the building officials, lots of people in the industry that are using our website, especially for the licensed lookups. So you do see our, our numbers drop dramatically on the weekends. And so that kind of plays itself out as far as the returning versus new visitors. I won't go through a lot of the other details, but you can see we, we can actually track on the location of where people are visiting our website from. You can see that over the next few pages. And as well as you can see um, how often, when was the last time, how often in between visits. You can see one called engagement. Again, this goes to the how long people spend on our website, and you can see the breakdown there. And then the final one is we are, since we are starting to see a lot more people in mobile and tablets, we're going to start monitoring this a little more closely. One of the great things about the new website, it is optimized for um, a smartphone. So if you shrink it down to the screen, the website automatically knows that and displays that. So you can see these are just, we're able to actually track the actual devices that people are visiting our website using. And so you can see the, the list of the top 10 devices that people are using to come to our website. Are there so, any questions by board members? Any, part, que any questions from the public? Well, okay, then I'll go ahead and continue on to into page two of the actual program update. There's just some information there on our social media, uh, the Flickr, Twitter, Twitter, and Facebook. You can see, again, not to get bogged down in statistics, there's just a few statistics about our Facebook uh, folks that are our fans. We feel the majority of these people actually are licensees or people in the industry. Um, so you see the breakdown, 30% women, uh, almost 70% men. Uh, the net likes and, and not likes, you can actually like our site or you can go back and unlike. And so you can see a chart there showing um, on the, the, the good part is the most people are liking us as opposed to unliking us. We have a few here and there. Our YouTube uh, continues to grow at a steady rate. I wanted to note for the board, one of the important things that we have on there is the, the videos on how to compete, complete a contractor license application. I just wanted to note about 14% of the people that go to our YouTube page are actually there to visit those. Uh, and, and view those videos, and those I think have been well received. Unfortunately, it hasn't had a huge impact on, um, we're still having a, a roughly the same number of people who are, are filing bad applications, but it's not because they're not watching the video. Uh, the email alert features are there at the bottom of page five and onto page six, and then you can see the brief um, information we wrote up on the catch a contractor. The, we taped that uh, episode back on November the 16th. The show aired in early December. It was a lot of fun. Adam Carolla and Skip Bedell, the, the two hosts of the show. Uh, it's a pretty big operation. I, you know, it's easy to forget, even on a, a, what's called a reality show, just how many people are there behind the scenes. There was a you know, full crew and you know, the catered tent and everything, which we did not get to participate in, but the uh, craft services and all that were there. Um, the show was fun. We got to, to we spent probably shooting probably a half hour, and I think about two minutes of it made it on, onto air, but we were able to give you know, some good messages out, uh, showing how the contractor's board is, was aggressive in this case, was going to be aggressive, and actually we do have a complaint opened on this case, and, and the investigation is proceeding. Then on page seven, you can see the uh, press release information as well as what Pastor mentioned, the press event that we did in October in Napa. Uh, not only is public affairs, but enforcement, others have had uh, a huge presence there. Not only did we do the sting operation, but we were also, along with enforcement and actually licensing division staff, helped out too and staffed two local assistance centers, one in Vallejo and one in Napa, that were open for more than three weeks. We had staff at each one of those facilities every day. Uh, our materials do remain there, but our staff isn't there on a daily basis, but we have our um, phone in hotline for victims that can call up. That's open Monday through Friday and, and they can go right into our call center if they do call those numbers and that is still open. And then you can see on page eight the uh, information about the Fall Blitz press conference that we had in Chula Vista. And wanted to note on page nine as far as the publications, uh, our staff did spend a lot of time um, working with the uh, executive office on the sunset report, which has been turned into legislature. That was quite an extensive report. I know the board members have seen that. Uh, we are continuing with some of our other materials and things are moving forward as we do have our graphic designer in place and is up to speed. We do have one opening for our information officer who also um, helps us with some of our video projects. So we are limping along until we can get that position <coughs> filled. 
On page 10, you see some of the senior scam stoppers, as uh, Pastor mentioned, 86 for the year, and actually one week, Jane conducted six of them in one week. Um, Monday through Thursday, she did one a day, and on Friday, she did two, just uh, for good measure. We're gonna try to have her uh, cut back a tiny bit next year, just because I, I just don't think that one person can physically you know, travel as much as she did, but she was you know, on an airplane almost every week this year and, and, and did a great job. Uh, and um, it's, been, it's been a great program and continues to be very popular as the word of it expands, the requests expand. And, and, and bless Jane, she's out there doing everything she can, but we're gonna try to tone her down a little bit. So don't be surprised if we come back a year from now and we say, well, we didn't quite do 86 this year, uh, but that'll be the reason why. And that concludes the report on the public affairs update. Yes. Um, just two things, Linda Clifford, board member. Um, first of all, the website is doing exactly what it should be doing. This is, I mean, it's a great tool because people coming on and, and learning more and getting more information and, uh, and, and going further into the website means that they're, you know, getting, getting what they need. So that's a good thing. That's going to, we're going to see the benefit through licensing and, and some of the other stuff too. So thank you for that. Great job. Um, I have one question, and that is, when will you start to publish the senior scam st stopper uh, schedule uh, for the next few months? I, I realize Jay's taking a break. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah, she's, she's definitely Christmas. taking a break from <laughs> conducting them, but the planning is already, we'll, we can make it available. We can email out to the board members. So obviously, we, we'd love to have you folks join us. So we'll, we'll mail you out where things stand, well, and we're happy to update you as anyone come on board. That would be great, because we are trying to go as many times as we can, especially when they're in our closer areas. So. Yeah, we'd be happy to provide you with the list as, as it develops. Thank you. Any other questions? Public, any questions from the public? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Okay, next is the legislation, uh, Joan Hancock. Hi, uh, agenda item H, legislative committee report. If you turn to H1, uh, Chief of Legislation, Laura Zuniga will present this report. Thank you. Um, the, Sorry, the program update. Okay, so we don't need to present the um, meeting summary. I think we do need to, a motion on the minutes. I'm not there yet. If oh. you had something in advance of that, um, I'm looking at H1. Oh, program oh I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I don't have anything for a program update beyond the um, committee summary. Moving right along <laughs> to agenda item H2, uh, review and approval of November 6, 2014 legislative committee summary report. Is there any discussion among this board with regard to that report or that committee meeting and report? How about the public? All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, moving to the legislative uh, H3, legislative proposals. The first one is the enforcement of the licensing provision. Right now, the BNP code section 7011.4 provides authority for our uh, enforcement reps to issue written notices to appear for uh, unlicensed practice but not for failure to carry workers' comp policy. This uh, proposal would um, ensure that uh, at this time staff is limited to uh, issuing a supplemental report um, <coughs> to the DA. So uh, while our associations, or excuse me, other agencies like Department of Industrial Relations or Department of Insurance, they have the power to cite individuals. Uh, those are for administrative actions only, and this would allow uh, us to file criminal charges um, after the DA to file such charge after the um, notice to appear. Now, uh, our book, or I think there's some Proposal language on page two of two. Uh, and we had a little bit of a discussion prior to this. Um, if you move down to the proposal language, which is 7011.4 subsection A, um, the last sentence, uh, which is quoted as saying, 
and ensuring payment of compensation that may become due to his or her employees. Uh, Paul and Linda, have, or Laura, are you going to uh, further elucidate on that sure. issue? Sure. Um, the reason it's worded that way in the proposal is it um, copies language in Labor Code Section 3700.5, which is the section of law that requires uh, employers to carry workers' compensation. That code section um, refers to it as payment of compensation. So it, it, while it sounds like we're talking about payment to employees, we're actually talking about workers' compensation. Um, however, it, it isn't clear when you read the proposed language. So we do have um, some modified language that um, I can read now. Um, so instead of what is in here, we would say uh, ensuring payment of workers' compensation insurance as required by Labor Code Section 3700.5. Just to be more clear. Um, so one of the provisios that we would have is that, you know, uh, this was, was offered just before we, uh, we sat down today, and um, I think it might be uh, prudent to have, give staff some leeway on the actual language, um, especially on this proposal. But in concept, um, could I have a motion to uh, motion approve? Motion language is proposed. <coughs> All right, any further discussion from the board? To approve language as proposed, we're referring to the, to the language proposed by Laura verbally just now, not what's in writing here. That is correct. Exactly, and um, if there's any further tweaking, um, I'm sure that uh, we can allow that to happen by, by our chief. All right, Joan, anybody in the Joan, board want to comment? Joan, anybody else? Just Pastor? You know, I just was wondering if, if uh, in building relationships with the other state departments, whether this proposal had been passed by them or passed by them so that they have any comment, number one. The other one is, is there any other issue that you think we might need to give our enforcement representatives uh, authority to issue something else that other than workers' comp at this point in time? I mean, right now we're dealing with workers' comp as an issue. Is there anything else that might be necessary down the road? Well, I think that's something that needs to be addressed first by Laura, and then probably Steve may want to weigh in on this, so. Um, that's all right. Okay, on the first part of your question, I would say we haven't specifically shared this proposal. I did ask uh, David Folk, because the idea came from enforcement, whether there were other state entities that already are doing this work, and mm -hmm. if, if this was going to be a duplication of effort, and there is not a statewide entity that does um, similar work where they're looking at, you know, like contractors or employers out in the field not having conversation and then um, issuing a, a citation like we do. So we aren't going to be duplicating the work of anyone else, but it is a good point. I think we need to, um, if we're going to go forward with this one, you know, make our partnering agencies aware and um, yeah. try to build support. I think David wants to add yeah, that. I, I would just add that this doesn't relate too much to partnering with other state agencies. Why this is important is because many, of, uh, many uh, county prosecutors are funded by the Department of Insurance's Workers' mm -hmm. Compensation Insurance Grant Program. That's so you've got a DA that files for workers' comp violations. And if you can, you can partner that workers' comp violation with unlicensed practice, that prosecutor can take your case. So we wouldn't use this for the most part if we're out with the Labor Commissioner or somebody else. They would want to, they'd want to pursue an administrative action. But if you're working in a county that wants you to file criminal uh, cases against contractors for being unlicensed and or unlicensed and uninsured, you can put both the violations now, you'll be able to put them both on the notice to appear form. And that's what's so important because you give the person a court date for two violations. Uh, on the second part of your question also, um, I think it's a, a good question if the board wants to discuss it. And this puts an emphasis on workers' compensation. And these people are probably violating other laws, um, tax laws, et cetera. So um, it, it puts a priority on workers' comp, and that's a priority for the board. Um, but that is something you could look at later if you want to expand this. Thank you. As we have a, um, a motion and a second, um, is there any further discussion? Public? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? No. Uh, was there some? Yeah, Kurt. Okay, uh, Dave. Just, uh, a Kurt. just a procedural issue, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and that is I'm, I'm assuming it's inherent 
as we go forward with each of these proposals when the board approves one that it sort of automatically grants the staff the flexibility to work with it work with the proposal as it gets as it enters and gets refined in the legislative process yes yeah that we when we had our training with when Laura put on the great training I think we explained that you know we have to work with legal counsel if we get the concept the concept's the most important part. Then legal counsel works with us, and then once it gets in the legislative process, the legislative counsel can change it, the author can change it. Sometimes the author will change it, so we have, you know, we can't support the bill anymore. But I think if, if Laura keeps training the board, it's really important that you understand the whole legislative process, what we can do and can do, and how it actually operates. But generally, we like to get the concept as tight as possible with the realization, working with legal counsel, we may have to change change the wording. Of course, we'll always come back to the board. If you have other issues, you know, you, you let us know. Give Laura a call or bring it up in a meeting. But that's generally how it works. Further comments? <coughs> all right. Uh, all, did we vote on that? All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> okay. Aye, aye, aye. Um, the motion carries. And moving to proposal number two, this is the authority to issue citations, collection of additional information. Um, for the record, we, we stewed. We had a lot of comment from committee members at the uh, November uh, meeting, and uh, we really worked hard on this one. Folks met afterwards and um, really have to commend Laura, and I know, Steve, you had a, probably some input on this too, but that... Um, what we came up with was something that everybody seemed to be able to um, support. So um, this would amend uh, Business and Professions Code Section 7028.6, allowing CSLB to collect both Social Security numbers and taxpayer identification numbers from non-licensed individuals. We currently have the power, obviously, to collect from licensed folks that are uh, applying for their license as a condition of receiving a license. Um, by having this information, CSL Bay would have greater opportunity for payment of citation fines um, through its connection with the uh, Franchise Tax Board Intercept Collect Collection Program. Uh, that, uh, the Franchise Tax Board requires that kind of identifying information in order to follow up. Um, Once this process is initiated, individuals are given 30 days to uh, dispute or settle the debt. So the language uh, is uh, on page 1 of 1, uh, subsection B of 7028.6. It's that entire paragraph that's underlined. Um, in short, it basically says the social, I'm, I'm briefing it, the social security number or taxpayer identification numbers shall be used only for the purpose of ensuring payment of a civil penalty and shall not be deemed to be a public record and shall not be open to the public for inspection. Um, uh, those provisios, I think, really were important in ensuring our comfort level with uh, this subject section. Uh, any comment by board members? Linda, Linda. Clifford, sorry, thank you. Linda Clifford, board member. Um, you know, we've watched so much of this, um, these penetrations into uh, getting personal records, and um, I appreciate that you, uh, Joan, said that we had a very uh, lengthy discussion about this because this is a, this is a concern. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. Um, the ability to uh, get more get more citations issued and paid is a is a good thing. However, I'm just wondering if there's a co you know if there's a cost associated with trying to protect this information, especially if it's being taken in the field uh, by you know on a field report that that's written and where does that <coughs> field report go? Because we have legal obligations, right, when it comes to social security numbers. And so we can say that once that, I know there's a bunch of stuff that Karen takes in, licensing that we take in, that is not public. And, and we have a way of protecting that within the licensing framework because the information's all internal. It's not 
it's not taken by somebody in the field and it doesn't travel through the field to some office someplace, right? Um, so I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about, I mean, Dave, this is really in your uh, bailiwick. I'm just a little bit nervous about it. Sure, if I could comment on that. We're, what we're talking about here are investigations and unlicensed practice, and they're almost always going to have what we call a, a departed motor vehicle sound X of display folder. We've got DMV information that we get by way of the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice audits us. That report is kept confidential at all times. Anything that's ever released is redacted. So if there's a driver's license number on it or a social security number, it's got to be taken out before it can be disclosed. And that's even by way of subpoena. So we guard it very carefully. Dave, did you have a question? So, okay, say uh, this goes through whatever, and you take their social security number or ta uh, taxpayer ID number. Can you use it or give it to another authority? Like, Beyond the Franchise Tax Board for collection purposes, no. Well, no, that's what I'm saying for what the Franchise Tax Board because I'm looking at something with the uh, non-licensed contractor in the underground economy because a good chance they're probably not paying taxes on the work they're doing. Right. We're not going to share it. Okay. I'm just wondering. You know, interestingly enough, we don't have a need to because if we want to share information, information for, with EDD, Employment Development Department, they don't require the Social Security number. It's a different identifier. Is there anybody else? I'm sorry. <laughs> Guy next to me. Paul. He's too close. Uh, Paul Shafino, board member. Um, you know, so you do an investigation. What's your social security number? Uh, they lie. They don't have it. Whatever. Driver's license. Show me your driver's license. You write down driver. Doesn't that get you to the same place? Unfortunately, today we don't have a collection agency to help us in collecting the unpaid civil penalties for unlicensed practice. The Franchise Tax Board is a very effective program. They will only accept a referral if they have a Social Security number. It's as crazy as that. If you don't have a Social Security number, you cannot make the referral to them. If it's not right, Thank it's you. Not right. Yeah, well, that answers the question. I suppose the question could be made what other agencies are doing this right now with Franchise Tax Board or departments, boards? Well, it's, well we're, we're, we can do it now with the licensees because on the application we ask for it and we tell them we will share it. And other agencies, when you sign up for, uh, you know, you register as an employer with EDD or you're, you're obtaining some type of a corporate status, you're going to provide that so they can share it. Our dilemma is we can't share it when somebody's unlicensed and clearly in the underground economy. And so this would be a very effective tool to be able to share that information for collection purposes, but also perhaps they should... Uh, it could be something they would consider for an audit, you know, if you're unlicensed. But that's right now we just can't work with them. Linda, uh, Linda Clifford, board member. Um, there are a lot of agencies who actually work with Franchise Tax Board. I am aware. I'm aware of that child support, uh, BOE, EDD. I mean, they all work with Franchise Tax Board. So we're not. We're definitely not pioneers on this issue with Franchise Tax Board. That I do know. I just Pastor. yeah, this is Pastor Herrera. I uh, I just you know I have some issues with this, and I'm just going to abstain on my vote on this. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Augie, Bill um, We we had a very long dis discussion on the the uh, acquisition and protection of the information, and you know we talked about the social securities maybe being turned over to immigration or something like. What it does is none of that is, is going to happen. What this does is it actually helps enforcement process cases because right now they can't ask for, what is it, through Franchise Task Board? You can't, or is it the DA? I forget. It was a month ago. Yeah, we, we can't uh, share information 47. with the Franchise Tax Board without the Social Security number. Right. So this is actually going to help in the enforcement and protect a lot of people that are working in the underground economy. So I'm, you know, just want you guys to know that this was a very heated debate and discussion that we had for about an hour. And uh, so I, with that, I'd like to make a motion to accept. Second. Any further discussion? I just have one more thing to say is, that is that we really, really stewed over this. We worked really hard, and I thought staff did a really good job of pulling out the the, uh, the the sections that I read out of that 
that paragraph to really, you know, work around trying to protect the interests of individuals, um, one and all, licensed, unlicensed. So we have a first and a second, and we have any discussion from the public at this time? Okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. And one, one abstention. Uh, two abstentions. Uh, two abstentions, thank you. The ayes have it. Uh, proposal number three is the notification by licensees of changes in recorded information. Um, Okay, this has to do with the conflictual language between uh, notice. Need a break? Oh, it's all right. Um, there's uh, some language uh, in the BMP code that conflicts with the 7083 section of the contractor state license law. Um, the contractor's license law gives a 90-day notice, the uh, section 136, which most DCA boards comply with, um, uh, talks about a 30-day notice. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the subsection B, actually, Laura, why don't you go ahead and just give a short synopsis. Sure. Um, this proposal was submitted by enforcement staff. It hasn't raised an issue that we're aware of, but it's a, a good technical cleanup. The general BNP provision applies to all the programs within the department and requires licensees to notify their board within 30 days of a change of their recorded information. Our law requires 90 days. Um, so to address the conflict and not deal with amending the law that applies to everyone, we would like to amend our law and just say notwithstanding any other provision of law, um, licensees have 90 days to submit their information. So. Second. Any uh, further discussion? Public? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Proposal four, effective disciplinary action by the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, Business and Professions Code, Section 7103. Um, we know that contractors are required to pay prevailing wages to workers on public works projects. Failure to do so can result in an issuance of a civil wage and penalty assessment, the CWPA. Most of these CWPAs are resolved when licensees paid money, pay their money owed to workers. This legislation would address those situations where uh, licensees fail to comply with the civil wage and penalty assessment. Um, presently, CSLB may only take action against a licensee when a willful or deliberate disregard of the labor code is substantiated. This in turn limits the Attorney General's office to pursue administrative actions against the contractor's license. CSLB desires an amendment to this BMP code to add a section of the law that will permit CSLB to use a certified copy of a final order of a CWPA issued by the DLSC as conclusive evidence to take disciplinary action against the contractor's license. At this time, uh, the language is on page 2 of 2, uh, 7103.5, violation of pervade prevailing wage requirements. It's one sentence. I'd like to ask for a motion to uh, pro Sorry, second. Any discussion from the board? Uh, uh, Frank. Um, my question would be, you know, uh, a wage, civil, uh, a, a wage, prevailing weight rate, wage violation could be one cent an hour mistake as a tabulation. Could be what? It could be a, up to. Uh, it could be as simple as one cent an hour. Could could be a wage violation, and and. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how this would be applied to those kind of instances where somebody, I mean, I have seen it happen. Wow, I, ouch, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, no, well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I share a very similar concern as Frank in as much as if there's a prevailing wage violation that goes through the DLSC, the DLSC is gonna penalize the contractor and make sure that the person is paid in full whatever that prevailing wage was. I don't see this as helping the public at all. This is the, the people, the contractors that are doing public works contracting are dealing with sophisticated public owners, generally sophisticated general contractors. They get caught up in a, in a prevailing wage issue totally, you know, on accident. 
uh, I mean, there's there's all sorts of cases. There's going to be willful. There's going to be you know accidental and negligent. I think this extends the CSLB into an area that is already taken care of by the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, and I am opposed to us meddling in this, at least as this is put out. Other comments, Linda. Uh, Linda, I want to also back this up and also say that because the law is evolving in the legislature that often general contractors can be hit with what subcontractors are doing and they, they're not they're not guilty but they but they have to get involved to fix it or withdraw money or whatever and so um, Ke you know Kevin's right I mean there there is a process the process makes you pay or you know, or, I mean, they sue you. I mean, you, you, you end up having to fix the problem. You can't, uh, you can't continue and not fix it. So in this one case, I mean, and, and Frank is right. You could be found guilty on a, a dollar or $10,000 or $50,000, but it's, it's a, it's, it's a my rate of, of numbers. Mm -hmm. Could I make a David, comment regarding this? David Fote. Yeah, it's, it's, the board established a public works unit a few years ago, and we thought we were just going to deal with, deal with licensing issues, but it's expanded into receiving a lot of referrals from uh, different groups regarding these uh, civil wage and penalty assessments. Now, as you point out, there's hundreds of them. It's not uncommon. Uh, the majority of them, nothing's ever done. We don't do anything with the, uh, the, the, the judgments or the labor commissioner findings. For those that are relatively minor, we're able to disclose on DLSC's website. So we can just link over if we decide to do so. But where we have a problem and the reason for this alleged proposal is because we have contractors that have literally uh, failed to pay their employees hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what they do is they'll reach a settlement with the labor commissioner to pay the money back. There's no willful or fraudulent or, or finding of a willful or fraudulent act. And they file bankruptcy. They reinvent themselves. So what we're really talking about here is just a handful of cases each year. And as the law is today, we are not able to take action because there's no finding. So those cases, we wrote up close to 20 of them in the last year. They went to the Attorney General's office. Every one of them had a financial injury to employees in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they all came back to us. And the Attorney General's office said, you have two choices. You can either change the law or the board could decide to put on the full hearing for DLSC. And we don't, we've not had the resources to do that. So I just mentioned that for your consideration. It's just a small number. It's the real egregious offenders. Uh, Pastor. Uh, David Diaz, sorry. OK. Uh, I've had personal experience with this. We, um, there were some jobs that we were checking on. I'm a union guy. You guys know that. So the contractor actually paid Ha, uh, paid the guys the proper wages and then had the guys kick them back at uh, another check, which was kind of dumb because they, they had a uh, <laughs> yeah, so they, had a, they tracked the checks and found out about it. But, but it, did, it did happen and it does happen more often than you think. And it's it, very egregious and it's, it's an awful lot of money. I mean, you're talking that the guys were supposed to be making a uh, prevailing rate of about 80 bucks an hour and they were basically getting paid that and then kicking back about another 60. So mm -hmm. it, it's bad. And that's, that's what I think they was trying to get after and go after. If, if I read this correctly, I mean, based on the analysis on the green sheet here, I mean, and, and Dave, David just mentioned that this is only for, for licensees that are egregious uh, with their public works payroll. I, and I think we're not talking about the $1 or the $2 or the $5. We're talking about a, a really egregious type of violation. And they do not take steps to mitigate the violation. So I think there's some language I don't know if this is the language of the of the proposed uh, uh, bill that you're trying to put, but I, is that really? I mean, I mean are, 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 are you saying that the language is just too I vague? I mean, how do we define what egregious no, think, is in this situation? I think it it, it, it uh, directs to the comment that that Frank said that you know you have licensees that are you know, they're going to come after or whoever's going to come after them 
for a dollar or two. I don't think it's, this is the case here. It says it's only egregious action. Paul Chifino. You saw me. Thank you. Um, Paul Chifino, <laughs> board member. Um, uh, um, the, the way the language is currently drafted, and I think it's just a language issue, but I'm having the same problem that Kevin's having and Frank brought up and that we're circling around. A certified copy of a final order. Where are you? I'm on the back page. The white page. Two, two page two, two of two. Okay, the white page. All right. The white page. And it says a certified <coughs> copy of a final order of a civil wage and penalty assessment by the Labor Commissioner may constitute grounds for disciplinary action by the board and be conclusive evidence thereof. Well, get, may I like that, Dave? That gives you your flexibility to do whatever you want. But we're, we're, this is a pretty big hammer that, that I think is being placed in your hands for a, a, you know some very reasonable mistakes that can be made in prevailing wage, and this isn't a union non-union. You know, generally this discrepancy shows not up with non-union guys, right. yeah. but that's not the point. The point is, if we're off by a penny, for any way in any way, shape, or form. Um, then it's in discretion of the CSLB to do what they will. I just think there's better language if we're going to go down this road, which I'm not sure I'm a huge advocate of anyway, but if we're going to go down that road, it needs to be worded a whole lot better than that. Mm, yeah, I agree. Kevin's had his hand up for a very long time. <laughs> I, I just, I, I think it's important we go back to what our charge is, and we're here to protect the public. And focus on prevailing wage. I'm a union contractor. I want everybody to pay prevailing wage. It drives me nuts to see people get taken advantage of where you see these kickback schemes that we all know exist out there and whatnot. But I think our board is here to protect the public and the public is not getting protected by making sure that the bridge guy pays, you know, 30, 43 on, you know, on wh whatever the number is. Um, and I just, I, I think this is getting into an area that, that we need to let the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement deal with. We need to let the public agencies deal with through their debarment procedures and, and really focus on, on the, the consumer. Uh, I agree. Augie Beltran and then Steve. <clears throat> so you're absolutely right. We do, we're here, we're charged to protect the public and everybody here is the public and everybody here pays taxes. And those taxes go into the bonds and tax measures that go into prevailing wage projects. This language is designed to protect the public, the taxpayer at large, and to protect um, uh, uh, employers, both union and non-union, from the unscrupulous employers that David spoke about that do force their employees to kick back, that do pay cash and falsify reports over and over and over again. Now, David and I spend quite a bit of time in that world chasing those people down, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot more of them than you think, and you guys aren't the fish we're looking for. The fish we're looking for are the ones that are taking your jobs away from you, hiring people and taking advantage of people because they don't have socials, because they come over here to make a living, and those are the unscrupulous that this language is designed to go after. So when you're thinking about this motion or this language or polishing it, Keep in mind that this protects everybody. And as a taxpayer who pays into taxes, and my taxes go to pay schools, if someone, both union or non-union, is not paying, being paid the correct rate, then that guy needs to be crucified. And this, hey, I don't have a problem with it. That's all I got to say. Steve, Sam. I think it's important to focus on one thing David said, is when these people are debarred, disbarred, for attorney, I know. Um, <laughs> and they declare bankruptcy, then they reform, and they get another license. Mm -hmm. And David and I get hammered all the time. Why the hell did this guy? He ripped off my workers. Why the hell did this? Did you issue this license? Nothing we can do. Is there a way to support the concept, but somehow narrow it to define? egregious, if you will, whether it's a dollar amount or day yet. I mean, if, if you guys think it's good, is there a way to define egregious? So I was going to ask that very question. Is there a way that we could um, amend this with an amendment that um, either sends it back? I, 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 we don't 
we can do a straight up or down vote, or we could send it back and you know work in committee and send it you back know. To the committee. I, I, to the I appreciate the fact that there's four contractors here that work in the public works field, and there's um, a lot of uh, labor people here. And the presentation by both sides, it does seem like maybe we should have those members work in committee together. Laura, Chief I, Laura, can I make a suggestion? Please so, do. I do think the discussion here has been very valuable, and I'd like to follow up with some of the members about their concerns. I think it would be best to not take a vote on this proposal today. Um, our next regular board meeting is in February. That is past the time when I would normally draft our legislative proposals, but it's still early enough that we would be able to add this into a bill or still find someone to sponsor it if we want to go forward. We have other proposals that will go forward. Um, so my suggestion would be that we just table it for now. and work it out at the staff level and I'll work with um, Joan as the committee chair and with other members who are interested and put it back on the agenda for February. I'd like to make a motion <laughs> to do that. Okay, that, so that's a motion to table. Is there a second? To table second. to February. Is there any further discussion from the board? Yeah. No, to move it to move it back to committee and to bring it forward in February in and you know in a framework that people could support. I think we're tabling it for now. Tabling it now. Laura, can you Yeah, help us. Uh, do you want to speak first? Um, do you want to make my suggestion? Reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this language is my language, like this land is my land, so I'll take the hit for that, okay? Uh, the second thing is I don't have a dog in this fight, but let me just talk about sort of the legal concerns that I have. Um, first on the motion, I don't know that we got a motion in a second, but I think it's certainly within this, uh, to go forward with this, I think it's certainly within this power, within the board's power to kind of turn that around and say, we just redirect this back to the legislative committee for further refinement in light of you wish to sort of perhaps apply this in the realm of egregious or significant uh, violations. So I think I think you can certainly do that. Let me just first speak to the issue that even even if we were to proceed in this vein, it's still, I think as Mr. Shafino pointed out, it's still within the discretion of CSLB to, to determine, you know, what it goes after because that's a prosecutorial function that's sort of vested within CSLB about who to go after given, you know, a full and complete and thorough analysis and complaint investigation. So, you know, in lights of, of that, um, I, I do not have a recommendation. I just wanted to point out that even with statutes that say, thus and such shall be grounds for discipline, shall constitute unprofessional action, it's still within the prosecutorial discretion of any regulatory agency to determine who it's going to enforce again. So with that, I'll leave you, I'll leave you alone. Laura? Um, as I was reminded, our next regularly scheduled meeting is in March, not February, but that would still allow for the changes. I don't know that we want the board wants to send it back to the legislative committee. The legislative committee would not ordinarily meet before the March board meeting. That's not to say the committee couldn't, but just something to take into consideration. Uh, if you okay, perhaps it would be prudent to um, ask for a, two members to do an advisory group. Um, I volunteer. And one other would be. Uh, I, uh, I, do we need to have committee members do this? Uh, do we need to have committee, legislative committee members be on this advisory board? Could somebody advise me? Okay, so the board subcommittee, I would like to ask uh, Kevin. Albanese and Augie Beltran to participate and thank all the other folks that offered to do that. Um, and I failed to ask if there was any member of the public uh, by the window over there that wanted to uh, have anything to say about this. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so be it. We don't need to vote on this. Uh, we're just remanding it back to. We don't need a motion. We don't need a motion. Okay, so the, I have to draw my. Just appointing a committee to okay. work on. That. I actually was going to get to that, but thank you for reminding me. And we'll just uh, appoint this committee of two uh, uh, to work as an advisory uh, to advise, help Laura come up with some language that seems to be palatable for all. Thank you. Moving right along to proposal number four. 
Kurt. I'm sorry, Kurt. Okay, we start from the premise that anytime Kurt talks, it's too much talking on my on my point. So, uh, on, from my part, I, I just want to be clear. I, I I don't know exactly the machinations of what you want to do, but if you want to create a subcommittee or, or something, I, I guess I guess that uh, is acceptable. I, I just respectfully, again, not not being Don Chang, I, I don't I don't understand. From a, from a just procedural perspective, you have a committee that apparently does legislation now. It's sort of vested with this obligation. There's nothing to say that other board members could not attend that meeting or we could not call a special meeting. And there's other board, board members like uh, Mr. Albanese and, and Mr. Shedder and Ms. Clifford could not come and make their make their public comments about what the board was doing, what the you know whatever the proposal was, and then they would also have that. Uh, the right to when it bubbles back up to the board and whatever incantation it does could express. Are that. you talking about a special committee meeting or a special board meeting? Just as, just sort of sending it down, back down to the committee and having them resolve the issue and then bubbling back up. That's all I was talking about. I, I think Steve. the intent was to have this the two members work with Laura and staff to come up with a plan mm -hmm. to give to the ledge committee that the, and then they'd have the ability to do it and then go to the board. We have time for that. And I want to clarify one thing that Kurt said is keep in mind the subcommittee, it, like, he, like he was saying, we have the prosecutorial, what is it? Discretion. Discretion. Mm -hmm. So there are ways that you could, the subcommittee, for example, could say, okay, the law is okay, but you have to have a reg or a board policy. What would it have to be? Um, probably I would go in further of the regulation, but. Again. Or, I mean, the cleanest thing would be it's in statute because then you future board. But, you know, the, the subcommittee could f listen to all these ideas and figure out what, what egregious is. I think that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then bring it to the ledge committee. And then the board, we ju just want to have the two members so we don't have to worry about, you know, noticing and all that kind of stuff to make it more of a technical working group to <coughs> before it goes to the committee. So you're saying bring it back to the committee before it brings it to the board? Well, yeah. now, Laura had made a comment that that might be too late it, uh, just suggest that we don't normally have a legislative committee meeting before the march board meeting we could we, but we, yes as i said we could so, so if the committee we wants shall to, okay. i mean we should if that's okay with everybody I, I also have one other recommendation for you to consider is that you know especially working with augie and some of our board members we could get a spot bill in have an author actually have a, a whole hold a bill for us and then if we can dump it in later that's Okay, I think uh, we've, uh, go ahead. Okay, I think that is the idea, is to have an advisory group of two with the idea of uh, forwarding this on to the legislative committee that will meet um, at the appropriate time before spring, and in February perhaps, if that would be timely. And uh, let's move on to proposal number five. Okay, this is the amendment to the Business and Professions Section 7137, and yes. Having read ahead, may I make a motion to pass this next motion, or this next proposal to increase the fees? It is a purely administrative uh, endeavor, and um, I think that's a great idea. Second. Yeah. Any discussion, Linda? Sorry, I just have a quick question. There's a bunch of blanks here. So what are we agreeing to? Um, That's called blank check. Right. <laughs> I, well, I just want to know what it is I'm voting for. We're, we're asking the board to approve the concept of approving these fees. We're currently conducting a workload analysis to determine what would be the appropriate fees to charge based on the amount of work this takes. Uh, we haven't finalized those numbers yet, so we will bring those back. Um, to the board at the next meeting, um, but at this meeting, we just need approval to go forward with this concept and to have the board okay with the idea of charging fees for these services. Any other discussion? Public comments? All those, uh, could I have a motion, please? A I'm sorry. Kevin, second. Uh, thank you, thank you. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Number six. This is Same the motion. 
Sam second. <laughs> Amendment to the Business and Professions Code 7152, Home Improvement Salesperson Registration. This um, has not, uh, we don't have the language and, but further analysis by Laura, do you have some comment? Uh, only this was um, suggested late by licensing, so we're still working on the language, but we think it'll be a benefit to all interested parties. Right now, it's a huge workload for licensing for the home improvement salesperson registration where it doesn't carry over to employers. These, this is a population that is mobile, um, so this will be a savings for the, the registrants. It'll be a, a savings for the board staff, so um, we'll have further details for you before the next board meeting. Well, we're meeting in February, maybe. Right. I have a big question. Ask for a motion for what? Question mark, question mark, question mark. So it does seem like um, this is not ripe for any type of, of vote at this time unless... Staff would like to request that if you, if you approve the concept, you allow us to maybe get a spot bill in and, and then uh, fill, fill, out, fill, it, fill in the blanks, if you will. All right. So your motion is... Kurt. Yeah. Members, I, I guess I would characterize this as the purest of the pure conceptual proposals. <laughs> and so I, I suppose uh, what, you're, what you're really suggesting here is conceptually you wish to, uh, you wish to authorize essentially the, move forward, the forwarding of a legislative proposal that will, without any, any language itself, will sort of embody these concepts of the pending notification of the pending registration to see the pending employment to CSLB. So I think you could you could move forward with the understanding that um, you would report that staff would report the progress back to the board in any language developed at the earliest opportunity possible so that the board could then revisit the That's issue right. and see if this was in fact what they wanted, yeah. what the board wanted. So I think you can proceed on that limited basis. Linda. Linda. Right. So I just would like to propose that, <clears throat> if you could, have that language for the ledge committee in February so then we could push that and whatever happens to the other thing um, forward. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody good with that? Okay. No vote needs to be taken on that. And I, is there? No, no, no. You need a vote to, to move it forward. Uh, we need a vote. Um, okay. Kevin. Why don't you go ahead and state your proposal? Your Kevin did it on second. Yeah. <laughs> that's my motion. Yeah, and that's my second. So yeah. Why don't you restate it, Laura? So the board will be approving the concept of this ledge proposal to allow home improvement salespersons to move their registration with their employer. Um, final language will come back to the board at the March meeting for final approval. It'll also go through the legislative committee before that. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any comments from the public? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Is there any um, outstanding proposals that were due today that aren't in our book? There was one proposal we discussed at the legislative committee meeting that is not in the packet that upon further consultation with um, enforcement and with legal, we have um, dropped it for now so we can continue to work on the issue. Um, Presented some and, and would that be something that you might want to bring to the uh, February committee meeting? Um, yes. If we need to go forward with it next year, it'll come up at the, the March board meeting, and we can bring it to the legislative committee in February. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. I think that concludes the uh, legislative report. Before Thank we you, go Chair. to the licensing uh, committee report, uh, is there anything from the public, uh, any public comment from legislation at all? No? Okay, moving forward to licensing, uh, licensing chair Linda Clifford. Thank you very much. Um, actually, Karen is going to give the, oops, I'm sorry. Linda Clifford, board chair, uh, uh, licensing chair. Um, I mean, board member, licensing chair. Sorry about that. Kind of trying to speed up. Um, Karen's going to briefly go through the licensing program update, which uh, is, uh, as usual, very, very complete and has uh, all of the information that we uh, find useful each time we meet. So, uh, Karen, if you would briefly do that for us, that would be great. I will be brief because David was only supposed to take two minutes and he took like a half an hour. So, the part, <laughs> the part you all wait for every meeting. Um, 
On the first two pages, you'll see the workload statistics, and um, yay, we're up 2% from the previous year, so we're finally starting to see a little bit of uptick in the number of applications received. On pages three and four is the information about the limited liability companies. Um, we're coming up on three years since we implemented that. They're not getting a whole lot better about submitting complete apps, but we're working with them, and you'll see the stats on page four, the numbers received, the numbers rejected, and it's pretty much just the same thing. They're not, the information from Secretary of State isn't matching what they're sending us, but we're working with them. Then on pages five and six is the Workers' Compensation Recertification Program. It was our hope when we rolled this out that we would see more licensees actually getting workers' compensation, but it doesn't seem to have changed a lot. We still have close to 60% um, of our licensees indicating that they have no workers and they're exempt from workers' comp. But even if it's not true, we're making them rely to us every two years. So that will help David as he moves along. Huh. <laughs> um, application processing route, I won't go over that. The criminal background unit statistics are on page nine. Um, well, the, the stats speak for themselves. We've gotten over 300,000 records since we originally rolled this out and almost 54,000 had criminal convictions. So, but that, pro that program is moving along very smoothly now. Um, the Licensing Information Center, our call center, you've got the stats over on page 11. Uh, the Licensing Information Center has continued to exceed the board goals, which we're answering 80% of the calls in four minutes or less. They averaged a minute and 48 seconds at answering 95% of the calls. So they're doing a great job. Uh, we've increased the training in um, the call center. Of course, as I always report, it's, it's a high turnover unit. So we're constantly in training mode, but we've got a really good <laughs> staff going there now. On pages 12, 13, I think 14 and 15 is the information about the judgment unit. These are the un or this is the unit that collects outstanding liabilities that um, are sent to us by Franchise Tax Board, DIR, um, as well as judgments that we receive against a contractor and bond payment of claims. And you'll see the numbers um, of the letters, you know, the initial and suspend letters, as well as the money that's been collected. And as you can see, we're, we're very instrumental in collecting a lot of money for the, the consumers, the um, other state agencies. So the final chart on page 15 shows the total amounts collected or that we were instrumental in collecting. The um, final pages are the number of weeks for processing applications, and they're broken down by the application type. We, we continue to stay pretty steady. We have our, our peaks and valleys on some of these, and it's just kind of the way the um, documents come in. And then that's it for licensing program update, unless there's any questions. Any question from the public? Oh, yes, go ahead. Two, two questions. Number one, on the workers' uh, comp uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, page, uh, page uh, sorry, page five, where they're uh, saying that they're exempt, is there any way to get a breakdown of how many A, how many B, and then how many specialty contractors are claiming this exemption? Because it I, blows my mind to see a concrete contractor with no employees. I, I know. Yeah, um, yeah. I bet we could. I'd have to put in a programming request, and it seems like we may have done that before. So, I will check with IT, and next meeting I'll give you a breakdown of the different classifications. Because 
perhaps the C39 yeah. is not the only specialty. Well, and of course, the C39 <laughs> have to have workers comp. They can't claim exempt. But no, of course, but but they're just like I mean. I, I think one of the other classifications we were worried about in the past was the C53 swimming pool. How does one guy build a pool? Um, C8. C12. I mean, C8, I think the, yeah. the list goes down the line. But no, I, I, think I no, I get it. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but when you see almost 60% of our licensees claiming they have no employees, it seems implausible. Yeah, especially on the specialty side. So that, yeah. that I think would be helpful for the board. The other question I had on the criminal background unit, page 19, seems to be a huge uh, length of time uh, to get that back. Is that something that the DOJ is causing us to be delayed or is that something internal? Yeah, we've been incurring um, a huge delay with the Department of Justice. It's starting to get a little better, but things were kind of rolling along smoothly until about the last six months. All of a sudden, we're getting delay notices um, that can go three, four, five months along. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have any control over that. We, we barely even have a contact person that can follow up with us, and for a while, DOJ even disconnected their phone line so people couldn't call in. Now, they caught a lot of heat for that, so they, they started it up again. But yeah, that's the biggest problem with criminal background is waiting for these DOJ clearances. Here's a concern, and maybe this goes to ledge, uh, is if, if a qualifier, and I mean, I've had to go through this, if a qualifier passes away, you got 90 days right. to get relicensed. And if you're getting hung up six weeks in DOJ, that's not going to happen, and we may want to consider some, I don't know, emergent, I don't know if emergency legislation, just something, because if, if these people can't get licensed and then they get in the 731 trap, we're in for a disaster. And Kevin, just to let you know, we did pass legislation last year or the year before that does account for that. If they file within the 90 days and they are delayed for some reason beyond their control, they get extensions. So yeah, that that won't be a problem. But the bigger problem is there are people out there waiting to get licensed and DOJ is sending us delay after delay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and just to, oh. to speak to that, we're seeing that across the board everywhere where we're running, for whatever reason, it, companies, everybody's running live scans on everyone now. Yeah. So I, I think it's not to make an excuse for DOJ uh, because, frankly, they should staff up and, because this isn't going away. It's not getting, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Um, and um, and so, and, and we're seeing it get worse. So it's good that you brought that up. I do want to just note that the number of weeks across the board, the number of weeks in licensing is going down. They are processing faster. Kind of, you know, we've got this DOJ thing too, so I, it's kind of a problem. But, uh, but I think the licensing unit is doing an amazing job bringing down how fast they're, they're getting these applications in. And so good job. Thank you. Okay, and then, oh, did you want to ask for questions from the public? or? Yes, I do want to ask for questions from the public about the licensing. We're going to go to testing next, but if there's anyone who has a licensing question, the board, no? Okay, mm -hmm. testing. Okay, testing is going to be really quick. Um, you have on page one the examination administration unit. This is the unit responsible for administering our 45 examinations at our eight offices. On the first page, you have the total number of exams scheduled from November 2013 to October 2014, so a year's worth. And then on the next page, it shows by testing site. You can see Norwalk is our highest testing site. Um, the EAU is fully staffed right now, which is great. And they are performing their occupational analysis and examinations um, in progress, and you'll see that on page three. On the left side are the occupational analysis in progress, and on the right are the new examinations in progress. We're also working on our new C-22 asbestos abatement examination. I was fortunate enough to take part in that uh, workshop. We had a great group that's putting together this new examination 
and we are expecting to have it ready by January 1st. Hopefully our regulation will also be effective January 1st. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, the testing unit also performed a civil service exam. They've been doing um, our enforcement representative examinations, and they administered one just recently on November 18th at five test centers. And that's it for testing. Just wonder. Show sure, everybody, you know, we have the highest number we've had in a year of uh, examinations uh, scheduled, so that's great. But I think also the new schedule, the new examination process is really user friendly. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like you could get them in there and they can t they can get the, to the exams and it, it's really good. So that's that's all good. And yes, just to remind everybody, I guess on December 16th, we will be talking about the uh, the C22 that Karen just referenced yes. to make sure that those come together uh, on January 1st. Um, so. Any comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Motion to approve and move on. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the licensing update. Okay. Um, executive committee report. Uh, Larry Parrott's going to give the administration update. He's been waiting there for like eight hours or something. Good evening. Um, <laughs> yeah. First of all, it's my pleasure to give the final update of the board meeting. It's also my pleasure to give the final update that Mr. Sands will ever hear from our board. Um, on a personal note, it's been my pleasure working for Mr. Sands. Um, sad to see him leave, uh, but um, I just want to say thanks for putting class into the word classification. <laughs> I thought about it, my wife advised, it, advised against it. Um, as a reminder, the administration division is a support uh, for the various divisions in CSLB. It does so through its personnel, office, and business services unit. Um, the following pages uh, list a lot of the activities that have occurred over the last several months, um, which um, describe the, the support that we provide. Um, on a couple of notes, um, I'm going to make this brief, but on a couple of notes, um, every year uh, our board tries to reconcile uh, the number of PYs or authorized positions that we have, that we think we have, versus uh, how many the department thinks that we have, versus how many SCO thinks that we have. Um, there's been no year that we've ever reconciled with all three entities. Um, for some reason or another, they just can't seem to get it right. But in this particular year, for the first time since I, I think I've been there, um, and I'm told ever, of course, who remembers that, but um, we finally have reconciled. So the number of positions that we have is the same number of positions as the Consumer Affairs thinks that we have, and, and the same number of positions that, that SCO uh, knows that we have. So that's a, a commendment to, commend, commending to uh, our personnel office and to Nicole Lay, who's our, our personnel officer. Um, I guess another important uh, uh, item is that um, uh, as Dave Fote uh, talked previously, um, his, his, and, and was a goal in our strategic plan, um, his goal was to put together a unit, develop a unit that consisted of all of our uh, special investigators, peace officers, and so our personnel office worked uh, with Dave's staff and uh, we put together duty statements and, and with the approval of, of consumer affairs, and, and we didn't need SCOs. Um, approval this time, um, we were able to put together that unit. So I think, David, I hope you're very happy with that. I know our staff loved working with your staff. And, and, um, um, and, and finally, um, as Steve is leaving, uh, we have at this particular time, I think in, in a 14-year period, uh, the least number of vacancies that, uh, that our board has had, uh, certainly since I've been there. And I think that's uh, uh, because we work very diligently at um, expediting the process whenever we can, um, reminding the, the various divisions that uh, to um, provide the paperwork necessary so that we can fill the vacancies that we have so that we can uh, continue to do business as, as, as efficiently as we possibly can. And that concludes my update, unless if there are any questions. So, Larry, you're, are you telling me it took 14 years for Steve to get it right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, Nicole Lee did a very good job <laughs> <laughs> with staff. <laughs> Thanks.
Any question from the public on that? I guess not. Uh, inform uh, information technology update, Raju Shah. Saw. Well, I was going to say good afternoon, but I'll say good evening as well. <laughs> Uh, Breeze, as you guys know, um, is DCA's enterprise-wide licensing and enforcement system. Um, they have implemented release one already, and uh, they're continuing to work with Accenture, who is, who is the implementer vendor, as well as the release one boards, to ensure that the Breeze system is meeting their operational needs according to their system requirements and modifications. They're also working with release two boards right now, and they're currently in their design phase. And there's eight uh, boards committees that you see listed there, dental board being one of them. <clears throat> the expected implementation date uh, for release two is uh, winter of 2015. Um, CSLB still is in release three, and we are continuing to work uh, to prepare for the phase three um, by working with program areas to document their business processes and um, as is and um, conducting meetings with the CSLB end users to validate those processes and uh, complete any gap analysis from the current system as we go to Breeze. Um, after all three releases are complete, Breeze would be the largest uh, enterprise licensing enforcement solution in the world. IVR um, is a, our interactive voice response system um, that CSLB houses. It's a self-directed and automated telephone system. It provides valuable information to anybody that calls it. Uh, it has uh, abilities such as callers could request forms or pamphlets that are immediately faxed to them. Uh, callers could look up a license check or check their application status. And there's dozens of uh, menu options within the IVR. And in the last three months, um, the system actually handled close to about 100,000 calls. So it is a very vital system that we use. Next page just kind of outlines the top 20 IVR requests that the system received. Um, it's pretty consistent month by month. And it's just a pictorial of it is the page after that. And I'll go to the next page. Um, the Infrared IT security. Um, we and the IT shop try to maintain a high level of security on all our uh, information technology systems and applications. And uh, we use a multi-layered defense to make sure that none of our systems ever get hacked. That includes firewalls, anti-spam, anti uh, virus, uh, event management, correlation tools, and various other tools to make sure um, that we're proactively denying anything that looks like um, something that shouldn't be coming onto our system. And we just kind of highlighted below there the various um, countries, including the U.S., China's after us, after the U.S., um, that actually tries to uh, reach our system, but we've successfully denied all of those attempts. Until date, we haven't had any unauthorized um, access to our systems. That concludes my IT update. See, North Korea doesn't like it, so. <laughs> North Korea is uh, on the list as well, yes. Uh, it should, it should help Sony out. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Any comments from the public? Nope. Thank you. Next is the budget update with Cindy Christensen. Uh, there really isn't much to report. We're on target as far as what we've been expending as of October 31st. Our revenue is coming in pretty well. This is an up year compared to others. It's every other year we have a up year in terms of revenue. Um, our fund condition is still looking good. Again, although we're projecting 3.9 months this year, we will be reverting about at least two months. So we'll still be pretty good as we project out to even 16, 17 because we don't expend everything. And construction management education account, as that's been reported, that is very low, and we're just going to have to wait till that builds up until we start dispersing those funds again to the schools. Any questions? Um, here's the statistical summary in terms of applications received, licensed population. So there's any questions? Any questions from the public? Mm, nope. And the strategic uh, plan update by short timer. I'm going to go through real quickly. So if you see an item you want me to, to, to elucidate further upon, please, uh, please let me know. For the licensing, they're all pretty much moving along. If you see anything dealing with breeze, Everything's up in the air, so just just realize realize that. Um, everything else uh, is in enforcement is going along. The number three 
Uh, we're still working on that uh, that letter. It's a, it's an IT issue, an enforcement on page two. So we're moving that to March 2015. Four is done. Um, Dave, can you touch base real real quickly on seven and eight on page two for those two enforcement objectives? Yeah, and if I could, about the uh, the consumer letter, I have really good news. Just came in about an hour ago that that letter is actually online now. So, Raju, thank you. Got it done today. Couldn't have told me two minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I just, was, just found out. Sorry about that. But as far as the disclosure of a partnering agency uh, action, what, what another, uh, it's been another success for our IT shop. They've put together, and I'm gonna let Raju, if, if I could, just really quickly discuss it. It's a landing, it's about the address so that it, that it matches. What we're doing today is we're disclosing Caltrans when they have an egregious stop notice. Only those that meet certain criteria are disclosed. And also if the labor commissioner, and that's where we go back to the civil wage and penalty assessments where it becomes a judgment, the egregious offenders we link up. And we're very careful in doing that. But there's an opportunity to do more with the cities and counties. There's an opportunity to do more with the Department of General Services, the Department of Corrections, when they've had contractors that have done egregious acts. And we don't want to take an administrative action. We just don't have the resources for it. So we need to look for a way to link to their website. So just following up with what David was saying, so we've done this with, with the LSC as well as Caltrans right now successfully. So we have a methodology basically we're using to link our site to theirs with the disclaimer and all of that. And we're going to continue working with other partnering agencies. We would, what we've done is developed a, basically a template as well as a sample of <clears throat> what a landing page should look like, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, for, with these um, partnering agencies. And um, as long as they are willing to work with us and partner with us and collaboration, we, you know, uh, our IT shop is also available to assist them with what kind of programming they would need or, and or how that page should look like. We've also gone ahead and drafted a template as well as some samples uh, for our partnering agencies. So we'll continue working on this. Anybody have any questions on that? Page three in public affairs, we've changed changed some dates. Number five and six have been, uh, and seven have been uh, delayed, as has eight, but they are, they continue to, to move forward. Part of that's because of staffing issues in public affairs and other priorities. Um, legislation, that's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Laura will be doing the training program under uh, item two. IT, again, Everything's tied to breeze. If you look at one, two, and three, we did submit BCPs uh, last year, which were denied. And I'll go on to my, my last uh, thing I want to talk to the board about. It's my recommendations for you for the future. Um, before I get to that, uh, I think it's he just couldn't see <laughs> being on the board without me. Um, but he's very happy. Uh, I saw, last week I saw Jim Miller, Steve Maddich, and Mark Thurman. Uh, a lot of you know them. They're all three doing very well. Jim Miller is retiring again. So he can spend even more time skiing and, and surfing. Um, as a board, the two most important things I want to, well, the main thing I want you to, to focus on, and you've done this, one of the reasons you're so successful is you work together so well. Over the last 14 years, most of your votes have been unanimous. Part of that's because of our com committee structure and it works so well. But remember, you're not one of 15, you're one fifteenth of one. If you keep that in mind, that's one of the reasons why you've worked so well together, because you work as a group, you get along, you communicate. That's the most important thing you can do in the future to, to be successful. And I want to stress too, continue to support the committee structure. Uh, I've seen boards that try and do everything at their board meetings, and they have two-day board meetings, and they bring the same agenda back two or three times. And, you know, the committee structure allows you to vet an issue. If you don't get it right, you bring it back to the committee, and it saves the board a lot of time, and I think it really improves the quality of the decisions that you make. It's so one of the reasons our board meetings are relatively short because you guys really work hard and hone them 
uh, you don't come up with a, you know, a half-baked issue for the, for the board to consider. Um, one thing I think you might want to consider in the future, too, is we used to do that strategic planning, but somehow you have to build into the agenda time just to talk. Uh, it's got to be agenda notice correctly, but whether it's strategic planning or you have a, a discussion regarding the state of the industry, I think, again, if you want to spend the time, you know, a lot of us, as soon as we get there, we start looking at our watches, looking at when we can leave, but it might be something you might want to think about in the future just to increase your idea, idea sharing. I think you guys really like that. As far as licensing, one of the, I believe very strongly in this, but I hope you continue to take the approach that we've got to do everything we can to get applicants licensed. Um, if you raise the standards too high, if you, if you review the applications too strictly, if you keep rejecting too many applications, they're going to go in the underground economy, they're not going to be under a regulatory tent, that complain to their industry, their legislators, whatever, I feel very strongly that it's a lot better to do what you can to figure out a way to get them licensed so you can regulate them. Um, so I'd like you to keep that in mind. Enforcement is incredible because they are nimble. David, and you change your priorities almost every year. You don't see boards doing that because it's like whack-a-mole. You know, different things come up, and we got to be able to, to react to it. And I hope you'll always continue to, to be nimble, and, and don't be frustrated if we're doing something one year, then two years we're doing something else entirely, because the marketplace changes. Some of the things that Dave and I are seeing is a lot more organized criminal activity. And we didn't used to do any of that, and it's a huge, huge problem. And Elder abuse, it's been big. The, the service and repair elder abuse problem is huge. Um, so specifically, I'd recommend you continue to try and get industry to help, get, try and get the administration to give us more enforcement uh, resources for criminal activity, remote locations, our citation program, and our public works uh, programs. We're desperately needed. And, all of this is in the sunset report. So I would hope the sunset report is your roadmap, you know, for the next uh, few years. The, some of the, my frustrations as registrar was not getting these things done, and I hope you continue to not give up. Figure out a way to do, deal with 7031, whether it's our role or, or someone else's. Um, we've talked to United Contractors and AGC, given them an idea for them to carry a bill. The language that we, I wouldn't recommend necessarily the board sponsor legislation this year, but if someone else has a bill and you support it, you might consider uh, supporting it or asking to be co sponsor it if, if you like, like the bill. Our arbitration program needs uh, overhaul. We've had a real hard time getting it through one of our uh, committees in the legislature. But it's a real shame that we can't fine tune that thing because it's an incredibly cheap, effective enforcement tool. And just overall, I know Paul would love to hear this, but we, we got to keep trying to simplify and streamline our, our law. That could take years, but I think it might be the, one of the most important things you can do uh, as a board. Um, I've been working for 53 years. I started working when I was 12, so I'm ready to retire. Um, and the only thing I want to leave you with, well, two things. I can honestly say that I'm leaving the board in a better shape than when I started. And it's not just because of me, because all of us together. I've had incredible board members and incredible staff. And the thing I'll always, I'll leave this meeting with is not only did I work for you and with you, but you're all my friends. And that means so much to me. You, you, are, my fr you are my friends. So thank you. Thank you. This is for you, Kurt. Any public comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, we have one March 16th in Glendale, June 2000, June 2015, of course, in Fairfield. That'll be the joint meeting with the Nevada Board. And we've got one in scheduled September in San Diego. So the 16th on Monday. Yes. Can I just say, March 16th. in the back of the book. Right. Can I just ask? Oh, right here? I don't have to write it down. It's right on the internet. So, can I just ask a question about, will there be a strategic planning session some at some point? Sorry. The department recommended that we not have full, full-blown uh, strategic planning sessions every year. So what, what uh, the board might want to do is in March or June, uh, just take the plan and have staff, you know, update it and then you all can may have the executive committee meet and have them review it and rather and then present it to the board for, for approval. That's what I recommend for this year, if you're all okay with that. Steve, did you get any comments from our uh, sunset report review by the legislator committee? I, uh -oh. Yeah, what in the hell did you send me this big report for? That was <laughs> 354 <laughs> pages. No, I, I, I did hear, I, I did, yeah, I heard it was, someone said it was the best report they'd ever seen. So that's, that's pretty good. Through the chair before we adjourn. You know, building on that, you know, earlier I had said that when I was in Sacramento, several people think this is a great board. And uh, I'd be remiss in saying if I hadn't said that uh, I was sitting down with Susan Bonilla the other day and assemblywoman from, uh, from uh, Contra Costa, and I'll tell you what, She's on board with CSLB big time. She really thinks we're a very professional board. Props to staff, because we wouldn't be a good board if it wasn't for a good staff. Thank you. All right. uh, before uh, I entertain a motion to adjourn, I'd just like to say again, thank you, Steve. You've been great. And I get to do it? You get to do it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, those, those going to dinner will meet right in the lobby at 6.30 if you can make it. We'll try to get the shovels and...